Dedication and Preface of Poems. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ian King. Poems by Marietta Holly. Dedication. When I wrote many of these verses, I was much younger than I am now, and the sweetest eyes in the world would brighten over them through the reader's love for me. I dedicate them to her memory, the memory of my mother. Preface All through my busy years of prose writing, I have occasionally jotted down idle thoughts in rhyme, imagining ideal scenes, ideal characters, and then, as is the way, I suppose, with more ambitious poets, trying to put myself inside the personalities I have invoked, trying to feel as they would be likely to, speak the words I fancied they would say. The many faults of my verses I can see only too well. Their merits, if they have any, I leave with the public, which has always been so kind to me, to discover. And, half hopefully, half fearfully, I send out the little craft on the wide sea, strewn with so many wrecks, but thinking it must be safer from adverse winds, because it carries so low a sail, and will cruise along so close to the shore, and not try to sail out in the deep waters. And so I bid the dear little wanderer, dear to me, Godspeed and bon voyage. Marietta Holly, New York, June 1887 End of the preface. What Makes the Summer by Marietta Holly Read for LibriVox.org by Ian King It is not the lark's clear tone Cleaving the morning air with a soaring cry Nor the nightingale's dulcet melody All the balmy night Not these alone make the sweet sounds of summer but the drone of beetle and bee, the murmurous hum of the fly, and the chirp of the cricket hidden out of sight, these help to make the summer. Not roses redly blown, nor golden lilies lighting the dusky meads, nor proud imperial pansies, nor queen cups quaint and rare, not these alone make the sweet sights of summer. But the countless forest leaves the myriad wayside weeds, and slender grasses springing up everywhere. These help to make the summer. One heaven bends above. The lowliest head oft times has sweetest rest. Oh, a songbird in the pine, and bee in the ivy low, is the same love. It is all God's summer. Well pleased is he, if we patiently do our best, so hum, little bee, and low green grasses grow. You help to make the summer. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Brothers by Marietta Holly Read for LibriVox.org The Brothers High on a rocky cliff did once a grey old castle stand, from whence rough bearded chieftains led their vassals ruled the land. For centuries had dwelt here sire and son till it befell, last of their ancient line two brothers here alone did dwell. The eldest was stern visaged, but the youngest smooth and fair of countenance both zealous men who bent the knee in prayer to god alone loved much read much his holy word and prayed above all gifts desired that they might see their lord for this the elder brother carved a silent cell of stone and in its deep and dreary depths he entered dwelt alone and strove with scourgings, vigils, fasts, to purify his gaze, and sought amidst these shadows to behold the master's face. 
and from the love of God that smiles on us from bright lipped flowers, and from the smile of God that falls in sunlight's golden showers, that thrills earth's slumbering heart so, or its warm rays fall, that it laughs out in beauty, turn to ye as from tempters all. From bird song running, mourn sweet scented, jealous, or with cheer. The child's light laughter, lifting low as souls, heaven near. From tears and glad smiles, link light and gloom of golden day. He counting these temptations all, austerely turned away. And thus he lived alone unblessed, and died unblessed alone save for a brother monk who held the carved cross of stone and his cold rigid grasp the while his dying eyes did wear a look of mortal striving mortal agony and prayer though at the very last as his stiff fingers dropped the cross a gleam as from some distant city swept his face across the clay lip settled into calm, thus did the monk attest, a look of one who through much peril enters into rest. Not thus did he, the younger brother, seek the master's face, but in earth's lowly places did he strive his steps to trace. Wherever want and grief besought with clamorous complaint, there he beheld his lord, naked, a thirst and faint. And when his hand was wet with tears, wrung with a grateful grasp, he lightly felt upon his palm the elder brother's clasp. And when above the loathsome couch of woe and want bent he, a low voice thrilled his soul, So have ye done it to me. Despised he not the mystic ties of blood, yet did he claim the broader, wider brotherhood with every race and name. To his own kin he kind and loyal was in truth, yet still his mother and his brethren were all who did God's will. All little ones were near to him for light from paradise seemed falling on him through their pure and innocent eyes. The very flowers that fringed cool streams and gemmed the dewy sod to his rapt vision seemed like the visible smiles of God. The deep's full heart that throbs unceasing against the silent ships, the waves together murmuring with weird mysterious lips, to hear their untranslated psalm drew down his anointed ear and listening low he heard god's voice to him was he so near the happy hum of bees to him made summer silent sweet not lightly did he view the very grass beneath his feet it paved his presence chamber where he walked a happy guest ah slight the veil between in very truth his life was blessed and when on still twilight passed he to the summer land those whom he had befriended weeping clinging to his hand the west gleamed with a sodden glory and from out of the glow trembled the semblance of a crown and rested on his brow and with wide eager eyes he smiled and stretched his hands abroad as if his dearest friend were welcoming him to his abode eternal silence sealed that wondrous smile as he cried thy face thy face dear lord and saying this he died but legends tell that on his grave fell such a strange pure light that wine-red roses planted thereupon would spring up 
white, holding such mystic healing in their cool snow bloom that lain on aching brows or sorrowful hearts they would ease their pain. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Rich Man's Reverie by Marietta Holly Read for LibriVox.org by Sandra Schmidt A Rich Man's Reverie The years go by, but they little seem like those within our dream. The years that stood in such luring guise, beckoning us into paradise, to jail us turn, as time goes by, guarding that fair land by and by, where we thought to blissfully rest. The sound of whose forest's balmy leaves, swaying to dream winds, strangely sweet, we heard in our bed, neath the cottage eaves, whose towers we saw in the western skies, when with eager eyes and tremulous lip, we watched the silent silver ship of the crescent moon, Sailing out and away over the land we would reach some day, some day. But years have flown, and our weary feet have never reached that isle of the blest. But care we have felt, and an aching breast, a lifelong struggle, grief, unrest that had no part in our boyish plans. And yet I have gold and houses and lands and laden vessels, a wide-winged fleet, that fly at my bidding across the sea, and hats are doffed by willing hands as I tread the village street. But wealth and fame are not to me what I thought that they would be. I turn from it all to wander back with memory down the dusty track of the years that lie between to the farmhouse old and brown, shaded with poplars dusky green. I pause at its gate, not a bearded man, but a boy with earnest eyes. I stand at the gate and look around at the fresh, fair world that before me lies. The misty mountain top aglow with love of the sun and the pleasant ground asleep at its feet with sunny dreams of milk-white flowers in its heart. And clear, the tall church spire in the distance gleams, pointing up to the tranquil sky's blue roof that seems so near. And up from the woods the morning breeze comes, freighted with all the rich perfume that from myriad spicy cups distills, loitering along over the locust trees, scattering down the plum tree's bloom in flakes of crimson snow, down on the gold of the daffodils that border the path below. At the silver thread of the rivulet tangled and knotted with fern and sedge, and the mill pond, like a diamond set in the streamlet's emerald edge. And over the stream, on the gradual hill, its headstones glimmering palely white, is the graveyard, quiet and still. I wade through its grasses, rank and deep, past slanting marbles, mossy and dim, carven with lines from some old hymn, to one where my mother used to lean on Sunday noons and weep. That tall white shape I looked upon with a mysterious dread, linking onto the senseless stone the image of the dead, the father I never had seen. I remember on dark nights of storm, when our parlour was bright and warm, I would turn away from its glowing light and look far out in the churchyard dim and with infinite pity think of him shut out alone in the dismal night. And the ruined mill by the waterfall I see again its crumbling wall, and I hear the water's song. It all comes back to me, 
its song comes back to me floating out like a spirit's call the drowsy air along blending forever with my name wonderful prophecies dreamy talk of future paths when i should walk crowned with manhood and honour and fame i shut my eyes and the rich perfume of the tropical lily fills the room from its censer of frosted snow but it seems to float to me through the night from those apple blossoms red and white that start the orchard's fragrant gloom those old boughs hanging low where my sister's swing swayed to and fro through the scented aisles of the air while her merry voice and her laugh rung out like a bird's to answer my brother's shout as he shook the boughs over her curly head till the blossoms fell in a rosy rain on her neck and her shining hair oh little belle oh little sister i loved so well it seems to me almost as if she died in that lost time so gay and fair and was buried in childhood's sunny plain and she who walks the street to-day or in gilded carriage sweeps through the town staring her humbler sisters down with her jewels gleaming like loosened flame proud of her grandeur and fine array is only a stranger who bears her name and the little boy who played with me hunting bird's nest in sheltered nooks trudging at nightfall after the cows exploring the barn loft fording the brooks ending in school time puzzled brows over the same small lesson books who knelt by my side in the twilight dim praying the lord our souls to keep then on the same pillow fell asleep hushed by our mother's evening hymn whose heart and mine kept such perfect time such loving cadence such tender rhyme blend in child grief and perfected in glee we meet on the street and we clasp the hand and our names on charitable papers stand side by side and we go and bow our two grey heads with prayer and vow in the same grand church and hasty word of anger has never our bosoms stirred yet a whole wide world is between us now how broad and deep does the gulf appear between the hearts that were so near i have pleasure grounds and mansions grand low-voiced servants come at my call from senate my name sounds over the land in eyes and nays so solemnly read they call me honourable general and all but to-night i am only charlie again i am charlie and want to lay my head on my mother's heart and rest with her soft hand pressed upon my brow curing its weary pain but never never more will it be for mould and marble rises now between my head and that loving breast and death has a cruel power to part forever gone and lost to me that true and tender heart Oh, mother, I've never found love like thine, never have eyes looked into mine with such proud love, such perfect trust, never have hands been so true and kind to lead me into the path of right, hands so gentle and soft and white that on my head like a blessing lay, and led me a child and guided my youth. Tonight tis a dreary thought in truth that those gentle hands are dust that i may be blamed and you not be said that i may be praised and you not be glad tis a dreary thought to your boy to-night that over your sweet smile over your brow the clay-cold turf is pressing now that never again as the twilight falls you will welcome your boy to the old brown walls of the homestead far away the homestead is ruined gone to decay but we read of a house not made with hands whose firm foundation forever stands and there is a twilight 
soft and sweet. Will she not stand with outstretched hands, my homesick eyes to meet, to welcome her boy as in days before, to home and to rest forevermore? But the years come and the years go, and they lay on her grave as they silently pass, red summer buds and wreaths of snow and springing and fading grass. And far away in an English town, in the secluded, tranquil shade of an old cathedral, quaint and brown, another grave is made, a small grave, yet so high it shadowed all the world to me and darkened earth and sky. But only for a time it passed, the unreasoning agony, like a cloud that drops its rain, and light shone into our hearts at last, and patience born of pain. And now, like a breath of healing balm, the sweet thought comes to me that my child has reached the isle of calm over the silent sea that my pure little Blanche is safe in truth, safe in immortal beauty and youth. When she left us in the twilight gloom, when she left her empty nest and the aching hearts below, full well, full well I know what tender-eyed angel bent down for my brown-eyed little bird from the shining battlement. I know with what fond caressing and loving smile and word and look of tender blessing she took her to her breast and led her into some quiet room in the mansions of the blessed. O oh, mother, beloved, O oh, child so dear, not by a wish would I lure you here. My son is a bright, brave boy with a grace of beauty caught from his mother's face, and his mother and he, in truth, are dear, full tenderly and fond and near, my heart is bound to my wife and child. But the summer of life is not its May, and dreams and hopes that our youth beguiled are but pallid forms of clay. There's the boy's first love and passionate dream, a face like a morning star, a gleam of hair, the hue of a robin's wing, brown hair, aglow with a golden sheen, and eyes the sweetest, that ever was seen. Mary, we have been parted long. You were proud, and we both were wrong. But tis over and past. No living gleam can come again to the dear dead dream. It is dead, so let it lie. But nothing, nothing can ever be like that old dream to you or to me. I think we shall know, shall know at last, all that was strange in all the past. Shall one day know, and shall haply see, that the sorrows and ills, that with tears and sighs we vainly endeavoured to flee, were angels, who, veiled in sorrow's guise, came to us only to bless. Maybe we shall kneel and kiss their feet, with grateful tears, when we shall meet their unveiled faces, pure and sweet, their eyes deep tenderness. We shall know, perchance, had these angels come like mendicants onto a kingly gate, when we said in joy's royal state, we had barred them from our home. But when in our doorway one appears, clothed in the purple of sorrow's power, he will enter in, no prayers or tears avail us in that hour. So what we call our pains and losses, we may not always count aright. The rough bars of our heavy crosses may change to living light. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Gloria the True by Marriott Holly. Read for LibriVox.org by Jule Niedermeyer. Gaily, a knight set forth against the foe, for a fair face had shone on him in dreams. A voice had stirred the silence of his sleep. Go, win the battle, and I will be thine. 
so for the love of those appealing eyes led by low accents of fair gloria's voice he wound the bugle down his castle steep and gaily rode to battle in the morn and none were braver in the tented field like lightning heralding the doomful bolt the enemy beheld his snowy plume and death lights flashed along his glancing spear but in the lonesome waters of the night an angel came and warned him with clear voice against high god his rash right arm was raised was rashly raised against the true the right he strove to drown the angel voice with song and merry laughter with his princely peers but still the angel bade him with clear voice go join the ranks you rashly have opposed o oh, angel cried he they are few and weak they may not stand before the press of knights but still the angel bade him with clear voice go help the weak against the mighty wrong at last the words sang deep within his heart with godlike courage cried he out at last o oh, gloria beautiful i can lose thee lose life and thee to battle for the right and when he joined the brave and stalwart ranks like saul amid his brethren he stood braver and seemlier than all his peers and nobly did he battle for the right gentlest unto the weak and in the fray so dauntless none no fear of man had he he wrought dismay in arrows blackened ranks so nobly did he battle for the right but at the last he lay on a lost field couched on a broken spear he pallid lay with dying lips he murmured gloria's name the field is lost and thou art lost to me when lo she stood beside him pure and fair with tender eyes that blessed him as he lay and lo she knelt and clasped his dying hands and murmured i'm thine am thine at last with wandering eyes he moaned all all is lost and i am dying ah not so she cried nothing is lost to him who dare be true who gives his life shall find it evermore methought i saw the spares beat down like crane and the ranks reel before the press of knights the leather crowned ran gory with our wounds methought the field was lost and then i fell be calm she cried the ride is never lost though spear and shield and cross may shattered be out of their dust shall spring avenging plates that yet shall rid us of some giant wrong and all the blood that falls in righteous cause each crimson drop shall nourish snowy flowers and quicken golden grain bright sheaves of good that under happier skies shall yet be reaped when right opposes wrong shall evil win nay never but the year of god is long and you are weary rest ye now in peace for so he giveth his beloved sleep he smiled and murmured low i am content with blissful tears that hid the battle's loss so held to her true heart he closed his eyes in quietest rest that ever he had known end of poem this recording is in the public domain. The Deacon's Daughter by Marietta Holly Read for LibriVox.org by Dom Bombadil The spare room windows wide were raised, And you could look that summer day On pastures green and sunny hills And low rills wandering away. Nearby the square front yard was sweet with rose and caraway. Upon a couch drawn near the light, the deacon's only daughter lay, bending upon the distant hills, her eyes of dark and thoughtful grey. 
the blue veins on her forehead shone, twas wasted so away. She moved, and from her slender hand fell off her mother's wedding ring. She smiled into her father's face. So drops from me each earthly thing. My hands are free to hold the flowers of the eternal spring. She had ever walked in quiet ways, not over beds of flowery ease. But Sundays in the village choir, she sweetly sang of ways of peace, of ways of peace and pleasantness. She trod such paths as these. No sweeter voice in all the choir, praise God in innocence and truth. The deacon in his straight-backed pew had dreams of her he lost in youth, and thought of fair-faced Hebrew mates, of Rachel and of Ruth. But she had faded day by day, growing more mild and pure and sweet, as nearer to her ear there came a distant sea's mysterious beat, till now this summer afternoon its waters touched her feet. Upon the painted porch without two women stood and whispered low. They thought she'd go out of the day. They said the deacon's wife went so. And then they gently pitied him. It was a dreadful blow. But she was good. She was prepared. She would be better off than here. And then they thought, it was strange that he, her father, had not shed a tear. And then they talked of news and all the promise of the year. Her father sat beside a bed, holding her cold hands tenderly. And to the everlasting hills he mutely turned his eyes away. My God, my shelter and my rock. Oh, shadow me today. He knew not when she crossed the stream and passed into the land unseen. So gently did she go from him into its pastures still and green, into the land of pure delight, and Jordan rolled between. Then knelt he down beside his dead, his white locks lit with sunset's flame. My God, oh, leave me not alone, but blessed be thy holy name. The golden gates were lifted up, the King of Glory came. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Songs as a Swallow by Marietta Holly. Read for LibriVox.org by Sarah Jennings. Spring. The sides of the hill were brown, but violet buds had started in grey and hidden nooks o'erhung by feathery ferns and heather, and a bird in an April morn was never lighter hearted than the pilot swallow we saw convoying sunny weather. And sunshine golden and gay voiced singing birds into the land. And this was the song, the clear, shrill song of the swallow, that it carolled back to the southern sun and his brown-winged band. Clear it arose, oh, follow me, come and follow, and follow. A tender story was in his eyes, he wished to tell me I knew, as he stood in the happy morn by my side at the garden gate. But I fancy the tall rose branches that bent and touched his brow were whispering to him, Wait, impatient heart, oh wait, before the bloom of the rose is the tender green of the leaf. Not rash was he who wisely followeth patient nature's ways. The lily bud of love should be swathed in a silken sheath, unfolding at will to summer bloom in the warm and perfect days. So silently sailed the early sun through clouds of fleecy white. So stood we in dreamy silence, enwrapped in a tender spell, but the pulses of soft spring air were quickened to fresh delight, for I read in his eye the story sweet he longed yet feared to tell. It spoke from his heart to mine, and needed no word from his mouth, and high o'er our heads rang out the happy song of the swallow. 
It cried to the sunshine and beauty and bloom of the south, exultingly caroling clear, O oh, follow me, O oh, follow. Spring Song of the Swallow Oh, the days are growing longer, so rang the jubilant song of the swallow. I come a-bringing beauty into the land, the sky of the west grows warm and yellow. Oh, gladness comes with my light-winged band, and the days are growing longer. Oh, the days are growing longer, the wavy gleam of fluttered wings, touching the silent earth so lightly, will wake all the sleeping beautiful things, the world will glow so brightly, brightly, and the days are growing longer. Oh, the days are growing longer, all the rivulets dumb will laugh and run over the meadows with dancing feet. Following the silvery plough of the sun will be furrows filled with wild flowers sweet, and the days are growing longer. Oh, the days are growing longer, over whispering streams will rushes lean, to answer the waves' soft murmurous call. The lily will bend from its watchtower green, to list to the lark's low madrigal, and the days are growing longer. Oh, the days are growing longer, when they lengthen to ripe and perfect prime, then, oh then, I will build my happy nest, and all in that pleasant and balmy time, there never will be a bird so blessed and the days are growing longer. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Songs of the Swallow Summer by Marietta Holly Read for LibriVox.org by Sandra Schmidt Summer Now sinks the summer sun into the sea Sure never such a sunset shone as this, That on its golden wing has borne such bliss, Dear love, to thee and me. Ah, life was drear and lonely, missing thee, Though what my loss I did not then divine. But all is past, the sweet words, thou art mine, Make bliss for thee and me. How swells the light breeze over the blossoming lea, Sure never winds swept past so sweet and low. No lonely, unblessed future waiteth now, dear love, for thee and me. Look upward over the glowing west, and see, surely the star of evening never shone with such a holy radiance. O oh, my own, heaven smiles on thee and me. Summer Song of the Swallow you will journey many a weary day and long, Ere you will see so restful and sweet a place As this, my home, my nest so downy and warm, The labour of many happy and hopeful days. But its low brown walls are laid and softly lined, And oh, full happily now my rest I take, And care not I when it lightly rocks in the wind, For the branch above, though it bends, will never break, and close by my side rings out the voice of my mate, my lover. Oh, the days are long, and the days are bright, and summer will last forever. Now the stream that divides us from perfect bliss seems floating past so narrow, so narrow you could span its wave such a morn as this, with a moment winged like a golden arrow, and the sweet wind waves all the tasseled broom, And over the hill does it loitering come, Oh, the perfect light, oh, the perfect bloom, And the silence is thrilled with the murmurous hum of the bees, The kissing the red-lipped clover. Oh, the days are long, and the days are bright, And summer will last forever. When the west is a golden glow, and lower the sun is sinking, large and round, Like a golden goblet spilling over, Glittering drops that drip to the ground. Then I spread my lustrous wings and cleave the air, Sailing high with a motion calm and slow. Far down, the green earth lies like a picture fair. Then, with rapid wing, I sink in the shining glow, a chasing the glinting, gleaming drops. Oh, a diver am I in a clear and golden sea, 
and summer will last forever. The leaves, with a pleasant rustling sound, are stirred of the night, and the stars are calm and bright, and I know, although I am only a little bird, one large, serious star is watching me all the night. For when the dewy leaves are waved by the breeze, I see it forever smiling down on me. So I cover my head with my wing and sleep in peace, as blessed as ever a little bird can be, and the silver moonlight falls over land and sea and river, and the nights are cool and the nights are still, and summer will last forever. I think you would journey many and many a day, ere you so contented and blessed a bird would see. Not all the wealth of the world could lure my love away, for my brown little nest is all the world to me. And care not I if brighter bowers there are lying close to the sun, where tall palms pierce the sky. Oh, you would journey a weary way and afar, ere you would behold a bird so blessed as I, and singing close to my side is my mate, my kin, my lover. Oh, the days are long, and the days are bright, and summer will last forever. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Songs of the Swallow, Autumn, by Marietta Holly, read for LibriVox.org, by Noel Badrian. Yes, yes, I dare say it is so, and you should be pitied, but how could I know, watching alone by the moonlit bay? But that is past for many a day, for the woman that loved died years ago years ago she had loving eyes with a wistful look in their depths that day and i know you took her face in your hands and read it o'er as if you should never see it more you were right for she died long years ago years ago had i trusted you for trust, you know, will keep love's fire forever aglow. Then what would have mattered, storm or sun? But the watching, the waiting, all is done. For the woman that loved died years ago, years ago. Yes, I think you are constant, true and good. I am tired and would love you if I could. I am tired, O oh friend, tired out, and yet, can we make sweet morn of the dim sunset? The woman that loved died years ago, years ago. Not a pulse of my heart is stirred by you. No, even your tears cannot move me now, so leave me alone. What is said is said. What boots your prayers, she is dead, is dead, The woman you loved long years ago, years ago. Autumn Song of the Swallow The sky is dark and the air is full of snow, I go to a warmer clime afar and away, Though my heart is so tired, I do not care for it now, but here, in my empty nest, I cannot stay. Thus cried the swallow. I go from the falling snow. Oh, follow me. Oh, follow. One night my mate came home with a broken wing. So he died. And my brood went long ago. And I am alone. And I have no heart to sing with no one to hear my song, and I must go, thus cried the swallow, away from dust and decay, oh, follow me, oh, follow. 
but I think I will never find so warm and safe a nest as my home in the pleasant days gone by, gone by. I think I shall never fold my wings in such happy rest, never again, oh, never again till I die. Thus cried the swallow, but I go from the falling snow, oh, follow me, oh, follow. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Coquette by Marietta Holly Read for LibriVox.org by Rosalind Carlyle How can I be to blame? Is it my fault I'm fair? I did not fashion my features or brush the gold in my hair. Because my eyes are so blue and bright, must I never look up from the ground, but put out with my eyelids snow their light, lest some foolish heart they should wound? How can I be in fault? I am sure where hearts are so few, it is difficult to discern the diamonds of paste from the true. I thought him, like all the rest, skilful in playing his part, as careful at cards or at chess as winning a woman's heart. I am sure it is nothing wrong, nothing to think of, and yet I know I lured him with glance and song into my shining net. Provokingly cold at first he seemed, like crystal to smiles and sighs, but at last he felt the magic that gleamed in my dreamy violet eyes. And I led him on and on, farther in truth than I strove, for he frightened me with the earnestness and violence of his love. These calm-eyed men deceive, had I known the man had a heart, I would have paused, I would, I believe, have acted a different part. In his royal indignation, he uttered some wholesome truth. He almost roused the emotion that died in my innocent youth. Emotion that lived when life was new, ere that man my pathway crossed, who played me a game untrue when I staked all my love and lost. Oh, for a saintly beauty! What efforts my soul did make! I thought all goodness and purity were possible for his sake. The world seemed born anew. My life such holy meaning wore. I fancy so fair and fond a dream never fell into ruins before. He toyed with my fresh affection as he breathed the country air to refresh him after a season of fashion and falsehood and glare. Had he not slain my tenderness, had my life been more sweet, I might have known nobler happiness than to humble men to my feet. But now I love to lure them on, to make them slaves to my gaze, like serfs to a conqueror's chariot, like moths to a candle blaze. I melt most royally time the peril and quaff the cup like a queen, and forget, in the dizzy tumult and whirl, the woman I might have been. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Little Nell by Marietta Holly, read for LibriVox.org by Gemma. Clasp your arms round her neck tonight, little Nell, arms so delicate, soft and white, and yet so strong in love's strange might. Clasp them round the kneeling form, fold them tenderly close and warm, and who can tell, but such slight links may draw her back, away from the fatal, fatal track. Who can tell, little Nell? Press your lips to the lips of snow, little Nell, O oh, baby heart, may you never know the anguish that makes them quiver so. But now in her weakness and mortal pain, let your kisses fall like a dewy rain. And who can tell but your innocent love, your childish kiss, may lure her back from the dread abyss? Who can tell, little Nell? Lay your cheek on her aching breast, little Nell. 
to you tis a refuge of holy rest, but a dying bird never drooped its crest with a deadlier pain in its wounded heart. Ah, love's sweet links may be torn apart, little Nell. The altar may flame with gems and gold, and splendor be bought, and peace be sold. But is it well, little Nell? Veil her face with your tresses bright, little Nell. Hide that vision out of her sight, those dark, dark eyes with their tender light. Uplift your pure face. Can it be she will bid farewell to heaven and thee, little Nell? No, your mute lips plead with eloquent power. Her tears fall like a tropic shower. All is well, little Nell. Close your blue eyes now in sleep, little Nell. Her angel smiles to see her weep. At morn a ship will cleave the deep, and one alone will be borne away, and one will clasp thee close and pray. O oh, little Nell, never, never beneath the sun will you dream what you this night have done, done so well, little Nell. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Fisher's Wife by Marietta Holly Read for LibraryVox.org by Sarah Jennings A long, low waste of yellow sand lay shining northward far as the eye could reach. Southward a rocky bluff rose high, broken in wild, fantastic shapes. Nearby, one jagged rock towered high, and o'er the waters leaned, like giants grim, striving to peer into the mysteries the ocean whispers off continually, and covers with her soft, treacherous face. For the rest the sun was sinking low, like a great golden globe into the sea. Above the rock a bird was flying, in dizzy circles with shrill cries, and on a plank floated from some wreck, with shreds of musty seaweed, clinging to it yet a woman sat, holding a child within her arms, a sweet-faced woman looking out to sea, with dark, patient eyes and singing to the child, and this the song she in the sunset sang. Thine eyes are brown, my beauty, brown and bright, drowned deep in languor now, the angel sleep, is clasping thee within her arms so white, bearing thee up the dreamland's sunny steep. O oh, baby, sleep, my baby, sleep. Thy father's boat, I see its swaying shroud, like a white seagull swinging to and fro, against the ledges of a crimson cloud, a tiny bird with fluttering wing of snow. O oh, baby, sleep, my baby, sleep. Thy father toils beyond the harbour bar, and singing at his toil he thinks of thee, lit by the red lamp of the evening star. Home he will come, will come to thee and me. O oh, baby, sleep, my baby, sleep. His cabin shall be bright with flowers sweet, the table shall be set, the fire shall glow. We'll wait within the door his coming steps to greet, and if my eye be sad, he will not know. Oh, baby sleep, my baby sleep. He will not pause to ponder things so slight, he is not one a smile to prize or miss. Yet he would shield us with a strong arm's might, and he will meet us with a loving kiss. Oh, baby sleep, my baby sleep. But would I could forget those other days, when, if with gayer gleam mine eyes had shone, or shade of sorrow gentlest eyes would gaze, with tender questioning into my own. Oh, baby sleep, my baby sleep. Thine eyes are brown, thou hast thy father's eyes, but those, my darling, those were clear and blue. Ah me, how sorrowful that seabird cries, cries for its mate, O oh, tender bird and true. My baby, sleep, my baby, sleep. Oh, of my truest love, well worthy he, and near was I, ah, nearest to his heart, but ships are parted on the dreary sea, swept by waves, forever swept apart. Oh, baby, sleep, my baby, sleep. And sometimes sad-eyed women sighing say, Sweet love is lost, all that remains is rest. So in their weakness they are lured to lay their head upon some strong and loving breast. Oh, baby, sleep, my baby, sleep. 
Our cabin stands upon the dreary sands, and it is sad to be alone, alone. But on my bosom thou hast lain thy hands, near to me art thou, near my precious one. My baby, sleep, my baby, sleep. The red light faded as she sung. A chill breeze rose and swept across the sea. She drew her cloak still closer round the child and turned toward the cabin. As she went, a faint glow glimmered in the east and slowly rose, the silver crescent of the moon. Another paler light than the warm sunset glow, but clear enough to guide her home. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Land of Long Ago by Marietta Holly Read for LibriVox.org by Ian King Now while the crimson light fades in the west And twilight drops her purple shadows low We stand with memory on the mountain's crest That overlooks the land of long ago Unmoved and still the form beside us stands While mournful tears our heavy eyes overflow as silently he lifts his shadowy hands and points us to the land of long ago. It lies in beauty neath our sad eyes range, bathed in a richer light, a warmer glow for fairer moons and sunsets rare and strange illume the landscape of the long ago. We see its veils of peace its hills of light shine in the rosy air. Ah, well we know that nevermore will bless our yearning sight, so fair and dear a land as long ago. We see the gleaming spires of those high halls we garnished with bright gems and precious show. No foot within the gilded doorway falls, empty the rooms within the long ago. Troops of white doves still haunt the shining towers and fold in blissful calm their wings of snow we bade them build their nests in brighter bowers but still they linger in the long ago there in its sunny bay stand stately ships we freighted for fair lands where we would go still gleams our gold within their secret crypts becalmed beside the shore of long ago. Between that land and this of dread and doubt, the silent years have drifted trackless snow, hiding the pathway where we wandered out, forever from the land of long ago. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Le Moyne by Marietta Holly Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson In the unquiet night, with all her beauty bright, She walketh my silent chamber to and fro, Not twice of the same mind, Sometimes unkind, unkind, And again no cooing dove hath a voice so sweet and low. Such madness of mirth lies in the haunting hazel eyes, When the melody of her laugh charms the listening night. Its glamour as of old my charmed senses hold, Forget I earth and heaven in the pleasures of sense and sight. With sudden gay caprice quaint sonnets doth she seize, Wedding them into sweetness falling from crimson lips, Holding the broidered flowers of those enchanted hours, when she wound my will with her silk round her white finger-tips. Then doth she silent stand, lifting her slender hand, on which gleams the ring I tore from his hand at Baywood. The tiny opal hearts are broken in two parts, and where the ruby burned there hangeth a drop of blood. Then with my burning cheek raising my head I speak, Le Moyne, Le Moyne, my lost, O oh, speak to me once, I pray. But no word will she deign. Adown the shining lane, the long and lustrous lane of the moonlight, she glides away. 
I fancy oft a stir of wings seem following her, trailing a terrible gloom along the oaken floor as she walks to and fro. Louder the strange sounds grow, to a nameless dreadful horror that floods the chamber o'er. And then I raise my head from terror-haunted bed, and hush my breath, and my very pulses hush and hark. But as I glance around, the stir, the murmuring sound, dies away in the moonlight, lying there stiff and stark. And thus you ever flee, elude and baffle me. My lady, you will not always so lightly glide away. Though on the swiftest breeze you sail o'er farthest sea, remember, side by side, we too will stand one day. Though my dust feed the wind, yours be with prayer consigned to keeping of churchyard seraphs and marble saints. Lemoyne, we too shall meet, and not then at my feet will you fetter a late repentance with wiles and tearful plaints. Repentance and strong that would have found a tongue, and shrieked the truth to heaven with maddening din, the truth of that dread hour, that black accursed hour, when to free you from hated fetters I plunged my soul in sin. Whatever wise man thinks, sin forges strongest links. You can break them never, although for a time you may hide buried in flowers and wine the chain of thine and mine at the last dread day of doom will draw us side by side if one then both are cursed and come the best the worst for ever and ever your fate and mine are entwined and though it be mad mad heaven knows the thought is glad i do not read my thoughts how can I help my mind? So silent doth she come, Standing here pale and dumb, With her finger laid on her lips In a warning way, Her dark eyes looking back As if upon her track and mine Some phantom shape of impending evil lay. But when I strive to see Of what she's warning me, Cruelly calm, No sign will she deign To love or fears unheeding vow or prayer as noiseless as the air she glideth into the pallid moonlight and disappears end of poem this recording is in the public domain sleep by marietta holly read for LibriVox.org by roslyn carlyle Come to me, soft-eyed sleep, with your ermine-sandaled feet. Press the pain from my troubled brow with your kisses, cool and sweet. Lull me with slumberous song, song of your clime, the blessed, while on my heavy eyelids your dewy fingers rest. Come with your native flowers, heart's ease and lotus bloom. Enwrap my weary senses with the cloud of their perfume. For the whispers of thought tire me, their constant dull repeat, like low waves throbbing, sobbing, with endless, endless beat. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Lady Maud by Marietta Holly. Read for LibriVox.org by Christine G. I sit in the cloud and the darkness, where I lost you peerless one. Your bright face shines upon fairer lands, like the dawning of the sun. And what to you is the rustic youth you sometimes smiled upon? You have roamed through mighty cities, by the Orient's gleaming sea, down the glittering streets of Venice and soft-skied Araby. Life to you has been an anthem, but a solemn dirge to me. For everywhere by Rome's bright hills, or by the silvery Rhine, you win all hearts to you where'er your glancing tresses shine, but darling, the love of the many is not a love like mine. Last night I heard your voice in my dreams, I woke with a joyous thrill, to hear but the half-awakened birds, for the dark dawn lingered still, and the lonesome sounds of the waters at the foot of Carrie's hill. 
Oh, the pines are dark on Carry's hill, and the waters are black below, but they shone like waves for Jasper, upon one day I know, the day I bore you out of the stream, with your face as white as snow. You lay like a lamb in my arms, so frail a thing so weak, and my coward lips said burning words they never had dared to speak, if they had not felt the chill of your brow, and the marble of your cheek. Life had been but a bitter gift that I faint would have thrown away, but I could have thanked my God on my knees for giving me life that day, as I took you lying so helpless from the gates of death away. How your noble kinsmen laughed and wept over their tresses snatched from the flood, and your white-faced brother brought me gold, you loved him or I could. Have obeyed the fiend that told me to curse him where he stood. Gold, oh darling, they had no need such insults to repeat. I knew the heaven was above the earth, I knew, I knew, my sweet, I was not worthy to touch the shoes that covered your dainty feet. I knew as you laid your hand in mine, so kind as I turned away, that we were severed as wide apart, that hour as we are today, and you in your stately English home, so far, so far away. That soft white hand your laid in mine, with smile as I turned to go, O oh, Lady Maud, I marvel, if you ever stoop so low, as to wonder what those tears meant, that glittering on its snow. But I know if you had dreamed the truth, your beautiful dark brown eyes would only have grown more gentle, with a sorrowful surprise, for a nobler and a kinder heart never beat beneath the skies. You never meant to give me pain, but oh, twas a cruel good, I so low of the world's esteem, you of such noble blood, that you stoop to as gentle words and deeds as ever an angel could. I blessed you for your brightness when you came unto our shore, for the dull earth caught a beauty it never had before, but you left a lonesome shadow that will lie there evermore. How proud the good ship bore you, adown the golden bay that will lie there evermore. How proud the good ship bore you, adown the golden bay, the sun's last light upon its sails, I stood there mournfully, for I know it left the darkness, took the sunlight all away. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Haunted Castle by Marietta Holly Read for LibriVox.org by Ian King It stands alone on a haunted shore With curious words of deathless lore On its massive gate impearled And its carefully guarded mystic key Locks in its silent mystery From the seeking eyes of the world. Oft do its stately walls repeat Echoes of music wildly sweet, Swelling to gladness high, With mournful ballads of ancient time, And funeral hymns and a nursery rhyme, Dying away in a sigh. Pictures out of each haunted room Up through the ghostly shadows loom, and gleam with a spectral light, Pictures lit with a radiant glow, And some that image such desolate woe, That weeping you turn from the sight. Shining like stars in the twilight gloom, Brows as white as a lily's bloom, Gleam from its lattice and door, And voices soft as a seraph's note, Through its mysterious chambers float, Back from eternity's shore. In the mournful silence of midnight air, You hear on its stately and winding stair The echoes of fairy feet, Gentle footsteps that lightly fall Through the enchanted castle hall And up in the golden street. And still in a dark forsaken tower, Crowned with a withered cypress flower, Is a bowed head turned away, A face like carved marble white, Sweet eyes drooping away from the light, shunning the eye of day. And oft, when the light burns low and dim, a haggard form, ungainly and grim, unbidden, enters the door. With chiding eyes whose burning light you fain would bury in darkness and night, never to meet you more. 
Mysteries strange its still walls keep. Strange are the forms that through it sweep, Walking by night and by day. But evermore will the castle hall Echo their footsteps' phantom fall, Till its walls shall crumble away. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Story of Gladys by Marietta Holly. Read for LibriVox.org by Christine G. I leave my child to heaven, and with these words, upon her lips the lady Mildred passed, unto the rest prepared for her pure soul. Words that meant only this I cannot trust, unto her earthly parents my young child. So leave her to her heavenly father's care, and heaven was gentle to the motherless, and fair and sweet to the maiden Gladys grew, a pure white rose in the old castle set, the while her father rioted abroad. But as the day grew near when he should give, by his dead lady's will his child her own, he having basely squandered all her wealth, to him entrusted to his land returned, and thrilled her trusting heart with terrors vague, of peril, of some shame to come to him, did she not yield unto his prayer command that she would to our lady's convent go forget the world and save him from disgrace but hidden as she had been all her life from tender human ties she loved the world with all her loving heart a fresh free world that god had made and this life seemed to her as but a living death a living tomb the harsh stone walls that from the convent frowned upon the peaceful valley sweet with flowers the beautiful green valley threaded by bright rivulets that sought the quiet ache dear haunt sought daily by her maiden feet and wilt thou not for my sake and thou shalt to save thy sire from shame so wore the days and still she did not promise though she wept at his wild pleadings trembled at his rage then of her mother's dying words he thought her dying words i leave my child to heaven and twisting them with his own wishes wove a chain therewith that bound her wavering will a chain made mighty by the golden threads of reverence and of holy memories and so with heavy heart she gave her vow that in the autumn she would leave the world but first for one free summer did she pray and through those bright spring days she roamed abroad and poured upon the winds her low complaints the while her dark soft eyes sought all the earth the beauteous earth that she too soon must leave and all her mournful murmurs ended thus with this sad cry of oh the happy world ended with these low words as a sigh i will obey but oh the happy world o oh, wondrous beauty of the morning skies o oh, wide green fields with beady dew impearled the lark soars upward singing as she flies o oh, wave of free swift wings o oh, happy world o oh, worldless wonder of the evening sky far ivory citadels with the flags unfurled Deep sapphire seas where rosy fleets float by, The golden shores remote, O oh, happy world! O oh, my blue violet by the laughing brook, My shy sweet darlings in your green leaves curled, Bright eyes sometimes you will all vainly look, For me your lover, O oh, the happy world! So passed the days of spring, and she must sign Dull papers to appease the hungry law, And to the castle down a writer came, no greybeard old and drier than his tomes, a tall fair-faced youth with bright bold gaze, and blood that leaped afresh with crimson wine, rash blood that led him to leap over a gate, five barred within the mossy park upon, the knight's old stumbling steed that played him false, to its own harm for which it lost its life, more fortunate a youth though bruised he, and bleeding from his many grievous wounds, and Gladys tended him with gentlest care, till love crept in and took the place of pain, and in her heart took pity's weeping place, and dwelt a king, he knew she was the bride, of heaven not to be vexed with earthly love, but yet upon the last night of his stay, as by the lake's low marge he met the maid, and saw her soft eyes fall before his own, he laid an almond blossom in her hand, a blossom that both sweet and bitter is, and said but this, Say, is there love a dream? Nay, not a dream, she murmured, looking out, to where the light upon the waters lay, a golden pathway leading to the sun. Their love the wakening is, the life we live, is but a dream, then with a sudden hope. He would have caught her hands, but no, she clasped them over the snowy muslin on her breast, 
and on her heart like drops of crimson blood there lay the almond blossoms bitter sweet and far away her pure eyes looked adown that shining path across the summer sea nay life a long dream is a sleep that lasts until we waken in the land of love but though thus calmly did she speak to him when he had gone to hide his breaking heart as best he might to bravely bide his time and do his life work as she bade him do then all her lonely haunts echoed this cry this cry of deep anguish oh my heart why did i pray for one more summer bright the outward world but held me in time past now life and love have added links of might a chain that fetters me that holds me fast i will i will obey but oh my heart my life was like some little mountain spring by slight waves stirred till some deep overflow swift breaks its peace then with its risen king down to the mighty deep it needs must go thus did i follow love but oh my heart for dear love sought me claimed me for his own and called me with his voice so strong so low i followed unto bliss thou hapless one i did bethink me of my cruel vow the vow i will obey but oh my heart and through the long still nights this cry was hers as on the couch she lay till dreary dawn her large eyes dark with horror looking out upon the pitchy darkness unafraid and as the breathings of the new spring breeze soft sighs of sad complaint to autumn storms that hold the burdened sorrow of a year was this her sigh of oh the happy world to this despairing cry of oh my heart and as the year's late winds leave pale and chill the earth so did this weary cry of hers so oft repeated leave her lips like snow and oft the lonely midnight heard her moan of hopes forgone that woman hold most dear no little ones to ever cling to me in closest love look on me through his eyes and call me mother bless me with his smile then low in tearful prayer her voice would sound despairing wailing through the lonely room the silent turret chamber steep and high thou maiden mother mary knows my heart thou who didst love and suffer look at me o oh, pity me sweet mother of the christ then with the passion of her woe die out in dreary calm as a chidden child who cries himself to rest sobs in his sleep so pitiful would sound the latest words i will i will be patient and obey but all the long day silent anguish all the secret tryst she kept alone with pain wore her meek face till like a spirit's looked it gleaming white from out her shadowy hair and so the last day came the day of doom the dreaded day when she should leave the world but he who holdeth little useless birds in his protecting care looked tenderly upon this patient soul so sorely tried this sweet soul purified by all its pain for on this day so fair a morn it seemed a heavenly peace sunk down to this sad earth from gate ajar the bright and pearly gate swung widely open for an angel guest a faithful servant climbed the winding stair sent by her eager father with the dawn to rouse her tell her that the hour had come when she to save his name should leave the world and as the woman stood beside the couch she said sweet soul she talks out in her sleep for there she lay with closed eyes murmuring low with mournful brow with sad lips oh dear love then cried out with a sob tis not a dream then spake of blood-red blossoms bitter sweet and with her white lips sighing this she sunk into what seemed to be a dreamless sleep and as the loving servant weeping stood loath to awake her to her evil doom she opened her large violet eyes and gazed upon the morning sunlight stealing in the clear light trembling growing on the wall and as she looked her eyes grew like the eyes of blessed angels looking on their lord and high toward heaven she lifted up her hands then clasped them in content upon her breast and cried out in a glad voice oh my heart and with such glory lighting up her face as if the flood of joy had filled her heart and over on her lips with blissful smiles she left the world and saved her sire from shame end of poem this recording is in the public domain farewell by marietta holly read for LibriVox .org by dom bombadil Lift up your brown eyes, darling, not timidly and shy, 
as in the fair lost past, not thus I'd have you meet my eye. But grave and calm and earnest, thus bravely should we part, not sorrowfully, not lightly, and so farewell, dear heart. Yes, fare thee well, farewell, whatever shall me betide, my gentlest angels comfort thee, and peace with thee abide. Our love was but a stormy love, tis your will we should part. So smile upon me once, darling, and then farewell, dear heart. But lay your hand once on my brow, set like a saintly crown. It will shield me, it will help me, to hurl temptations down. God give thee better love than mine. Nay, dear, no tears must start. See, I'm quiet, thou must be. And now, farewell, dear heart. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Night of Normandy by Marietta Holly. Read for LibriVox.org by Dom Bombadil. Clear shone the moon, my mansion walls towered wide above the wood. Near, down the dark oak avenue, an humble cottage stood. My gardener's cottage, small and brown, yet precious unto me. For there she dwelt, who sat by me, that night beside the sea. So sweet the white rose on her neck was not more fair than she. As silently her soft brown eyes looked outward over the sea. So still the muslin o'er her heart seemed with no breath to stir, as silently she sat and heard the tale I told to her. It was the night of Normandy, he vowed on his good sword, he would not wed his father's choice, the Lady Hildegard. Near dwelt a beauteous Edith, a lowly maiden she. Ah, still unmoved, her dark sweet eyes looked far away from me. Dearer to him one blossom small, that had but touched her hand, than all the high-born beauties, the ladies of the land. Dearer to him, quick came my breath, as I looked down on her, but the white roses in her hand, no lightest leaf did stir. Ah, wistfully I read her face, full gently did I speak, no light dawned in her tender eye, no flush stole over her cheek. He wore her colors on the field, he went where brave hearts were. Ah, gallantly and nobly he fought for love of her. He loved her with his whole true heart. Now, like a sudden flame, up to her cheeks so pure and white, a flood of crimson came. Her hands unclasped down to her feet, my flowers unnoticed shook. I leaned and followed with my gaze, a glad and eager look. I saw a boat sweep round the rock, rowed with a steady grace. I saw the fisher's manly form, his brown and handsome face. For love of her, to victory, he his brave squadron led, then broke his true heart and her scarf, pillowed his dying head. So died this knight of Normandy, died with his sword unstained. I know not that she heard my words, so near the boat had gained. I said, Heaven bless her in my heart, she had no thought for me. I turned away and left them there, beside the beating sea. Behind me lay the sweet moonlight, my shadow went before, and past the dark and gloomy shape, before me through the door. Oh, strange and sad this life of ours, this life beneath the sun, how oh, sad and strange and full of pain! God help us, every one. God help us that we may endure, like him of Normandy, and die with sword unstained that has led us to victory. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.
Some Time by Marietta Holly Read for LibriVox.org by Ian King On the shore I sit and gaze Out on the twilight sea For my ship may come Though many days I have waited patiently With waiting, trusting eyes A lonely watch I keep For its silver sails to rise Like a blossom out of the deep it is built of a costly wood, bearing the strange perfume of the gorgeous solitude where it grew in tropical gloom, and the odorous scent, the spicy balm of its isle it will bear to me as I stand on the shore in the magic calm and my ship come in from sea. It is laden with all that is sweet of the beauty of every clime, Slowly and proudly twill glide to my feet In the eve of that fair some time. Before me its sails will be furled, A princess I shall be, Crowned with the wealth of the world, When my ship comes in from sea. Sweet faces I then shall see, Tender, undoubting, true, Soft hands will be stretched to me With a welcome I never knew. In the peace of such tenderness I shall rest for evermore And weep in my perfect bliss As I never wept before. Sometimes I think it is not far And I bend my head and list For I think I see a slender spar Gleam through the golden mist And I fancy I hear the sound Of wind in a silken sail And an odour rare from eastern ground Floats in on the languid gale. But I sit and watch the west till the sun goes down in vain. It was only a cloud with an ivory crest, a cloud of vapour and rain. It rises and hides the sea, and my heart grows chill and numb, lest this terrible thing should be, that my ship will never come. But the morn is bright, the wave is a golden and shining track. Softly the waters, the white sands lave, And my trusting faith comes back. O oh, all that I ever lost, and all that I long to be, Will be mine when the deep is crossed, And my ship comes home from sea. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Motives by Marietta Holly Read for LibriVox.org by Noel Badrian I said that I would see her once To curse her fair deceitful grace To curse her for my lifelong agony But when I saw her face I said Sweet Christ forgive both her and me High swelled the chanted hymn Low on the marble swept the velvet pall. I bent above, and my eyes grew dim. My sad heart saw it all. She loved me, loved me, though she wedded him. And then shot through my soul a thrill of fierce delight to think that he must yield her form, his all, to death's control the while her love for me would live when sun and stars had ceased to roll. But no, on the white brow, graved in its marble, was deep calm impressed, saying that peace had come to her through woe, saying she had found rest at last, and I, I must not love her now. It may be in heaven's grace, beneath the shade of some immortal palm, that God will let me see her angel face. Then wild, wild heart be calm, wipe out that old love, every sorrowful trace. I know that if it be, we two should meet again in paradise, t'would trouble her pure soul if she should see the old grief in my eyes, t'would grieve her dear heart through eternity. 
wipe out that grief my soul and shall i lose all love in losing this unclasp my spirit self's close stolid stole are there no lives to bless so will i give my love my life no stinted dole god will note deeds and sighs throned in far splendour on the heavenly hill though mad sounds from this wretched planet rise moans wild enough to fill heaven's air and drown its harps in doleful cries and angels shall look down through incense rising from my godly deeds approving gleam those eyes of tender brown sure on a brow that bleeds the thorns should change to a more glorious crown well done my soul well done out of thy grief to rear a ladder tall to reach the land that lies beyond the sun to scale the jasper wall and rise to glory on grief's stepping stone god looks into the tide angel and demon troubled of a man's mind and if my arms are scattered far and wide only my love to find only to pave a path to reach her side will he accept from me my worship gifts the heavens are very still no answer do i hear no sign i see if i but knew his will would he come a-walking on the sea the storm is overpast for sweet and fair a sudden radiance shone o'er wave and lee and in the glory trembling through the air he came unto me walking on the sea the heavy waves that had rushed to and fro cowered at his feet in sudden melody and all transfigured in the shining glow did he come to me walking on the sea far off i saw his form but knew it not he nearer drew he smiled my fears did flee his loving look dispelled a lingering doubt as he came to me o'er the twilight sea i dropped my burden on the shelving sand so i might meet him if such bliss could be i reached the shore i knelt and kissed his hand with blissful tears beside the twilight sea such love he woke i would my life have lain low down to pave his way he loveth me who loveth the sad world and blesseth man came blown to me across the twilight sea perplexing questions died within my breast deep peace hath he who doeth lovingly my will who loveth most he loveth best came blown to me across the twilight sea the storm was overpast a breath of balm lapped the low waves and lingered on the lee for in the twilight fell a holy calm he came unto me walking on the sea was this a dream if it were not a dream my life is blessed in truth and if it be i know across the deep has fallen a gleam a bridge of glory spans the twilight sea end of poem this recording is in the public domain Nightfall by Marietta Holly, read for LibriVox.org by Christine G. Soft over the meadow and murmuring mare falleth a shadow near and more near. Day like a white dove floats down the sky. Cometh the night, love, darkness is nigh. So dies the happiest day. Slow in thy dark eye riseth a tear. Hear I thy sad sigh, sorrow is near. Hope smiling bright, love dies on my breast, as day like a white dove flies down the west. So dies the happiest day. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. His Place by Marietta Holly. Read for LibriVox.org by Bruno Go Luce. So all things come to our mind at last. 
He is close by your side in the twilight gloom, and you two are alone in the dim old room. Yet he is mute, as you bade him be, time past. You bade him to weary you never again with his idle love. In truth he was wise, for he spake no more, although in his eyes you read, you fancied, a language of pain. But this is past, and vex you he never will, with loving glance or look of sad reproach. His lips move not, smile not at your approach. The flowers he clasps are not more calm and still. Your favorite flowers he has heard you praise, purple pansies and lilies creamy white, but he offers them not to you tonight. He troubles you not, he has learned his place. You wish to teach him that lesson, you told him as much, you know, in this very room. T'was about this hour, for the twilight gloom as now was enwrapping you, fold on fold. Was his place in the haunts of the herded poor, where the pestilence stalked with deadly breath? Face to face with its dreadful shadow death, how he wrestled with it from door to door, giving his life that others' life might find, shaming you with his toil, his bravery. Not by a word or look, no boaster he, he was always gentle to you and kind. He has found his place, but no need of fears, no. You need not summon your jealous pride, for his place will never be by your side. Never more, never more, through all the years. And when from time shall drop earth's days, like chaff from the bloom of the year sublime, with the gentle spirits of every time, and the martyr souls, he will find his place. So answers will come to our seeking wills, never more will his sad face vex your sight, for you never will make your robes so white as to stand by him on the heavenly hills. Yes, lay your cheek upon his, and press the clustering hair from his broad white brow. Have no fear, he will not annoy you now by a word in praise of your loveliness. Yes, kneel by him, moaning, kissing his brow. Not now will it grieve him, your tears swift rain, and he will not ask you to share his pain. Ah, once he would, but not now. Not now. So leave the old room in the waning light. Go out in your peerless beauty and pride, and let no shadow go out by your side to follow you under the falling night. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Dream of Spring by Marietta Holly Read for LibriVox.org by Roslyn Carlyle the world is asleep, all hushed is nature's warm, sweet breath. The world is asleep, and dreaming the silent dream of snow. But through the silence that seems like the silence of death, under their shroud of ermine, the souls of the roses glow. And forever the heart of the water throbs and beats, though bound by a million gleaming fetters and crystal rings. No sound on lonesome mornings the lonely watcher greets, but the frosty pane is impressed with the shadow of coming wings. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Waiting by Marietta Holly Read for LibriVox.org by Julia Niedermeyer. I know not where you wait for me in all your maiden sweetness, sweet soul in whom my life will find its rest, its full completeness. But somewhere you await me, fate will lead us to each other, as roses know the sunlight, so shall we know one another. Dear heart, what are you doing in this twilight's purple splendour? Do you tend your dewy flowers with fingers white and slender? 
heavy, odor-laden branches in blessing bent above you, fond lilies kneeling at your feet, winds murmuring they love you. Mayhap your heart in maiden peace is like a closed bud sleeping, wrapped in pure folds of saintly thought, its tender freshness keeping. Yet, like a dream that comes in sleep, your soul's sweet quiet breaking, is a thought of me, my darling, that shall come true on waking. Perchance you turn from passionate vows, words wild with love's sweet madness, with soft eyes looking far away in yearning trust and sadness, a look that tells his alien soul how widely you are parted, though he knows not whom your rapt eyes seek, my sweet, my loving-hearted. Oh, the world is rough, the heart against its sneer, its cold derision, locks all its better feelings, making it a gloomy prison. But your hand, my angel, shall unlock its rocky, dust-strewn portal. Your smile shall rouse its dying dreams of good to life immortal. You will make me better, purer, for love, the true refiner. Burning out the baser passions will kindle the diviner will plead and wind my spirit not to shame its heavenly station you will trust me and that trust will prove my tempted soul's salvation god keep you tenderly my life's dear hope and unseen blessing o oh, night wind touch her tresses till i come with fond caressing thy crown of pearl-linked light o oh, royal moon stoop down and give her Till queen of love's own kingdom, I crown her mine forever. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A song for twilight. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Dom Bombadil Poems by Marietta Holly A Song for Twilight Oh, the day was dark and dreary, For clouds swept o'er the sun. The burden of life seemed heavy, And its warfare never done. But I heard a voice at twilight, It whispered in my ear, Oh, doubting heart, look upward, Dear soul, be of good cheer. O oh, weary heart, look upward. Dear soul, be of good cheer. And lo, on looking upward, The stars lit up the sky, Like the lights of an endless city, A city set on high. And my heart forgot its sorrow, These heavenly homes to see. Sure, in those many mansions Is room for even me. Sure, in those many mansions is room for thee and me. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Flight by Marietta Holly Read for LibriVox.org by Lynn Thompson here in the silent doorway let me linger one moment for the porch is still and lonely that shadows but the rose vine in the moonlight all are asleep in peace i waken only and he i wait by my own heart's beating i know how slow to him the tide creeps by nor life nor death could bar our hearts from meeting were worlds between his soul to mine would fly Oh shame to think a heap of paltry metal should overbalance manhood's noblest graces a film of gold had gilt his worth and honour warming to smiles the coldness of their faces gentle to me they rise in condemnation and plead with me than words more powerfully oh well i love them but they have wealth and station to fill their hearts and he has only me 
but oh my roses how their great pure faces beseech me as they bend from sculptured column so with my wet cheek closely pressed against them i listen to their pleadings sweet and solemn o oh, memory if an hour of gloom and grieving i here have known that hour before me set but all the peace and joy i am leaving in mercy memory let me forget o oh, home if here a frown has ever chilled me let me now rise and darken on my sight if a harsh word or look has ever grieved me let me remember that harsh word to-night but all the tender words the fond caressing the loving smiles that daily i have met the patient mother love god's crowning blessing in mercy memory let me forget here she has kissed me with fond looks of greeting will that smile fade when waiting me no longer o oh, true first love tender and changing never but there's a love that nearer is and stronger he comes i kneel and kiss the stone o oh, mother where you have stood and blessed me with your eyes forgive forgive me mother father brother for oh he loves me and love sanctifies end of poem this recording is in the public domain Comfort by Mary Edda Holly. Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson. Once through an autumn wood I roamed in tearful mood, by grief dismayed, doubting, and ill at ease, when from a leafless oak methought low murmurs broke, complaining accents as of words like these. Incline thy mighty ear, great mother earth, and hear how I, thy child, am sorely vexed and tossed no one to heed my moan i shudder here alone with my destroyers wind and snow and frost then low and unaware this answer cleaved the air this tender answer doubting one be still o oh, trust to me and know the wind the frost the snow are but my servants sent to do my will for the destroyer frost his labor is not lost rid thee he shall of many noisome things and thou shalt praise the snow when drinking far below refreshment sweet from overflowing springs my child thou art not alone i love thee hear thy moan but winds that fret thee only causeth thee to more securely stand more firmly clasp my hand and soaring upward closer cling to me then from my burdened heart the shadows did depart then i said softly winds of sorrow blow so i but closer cling to thee my lord my king who loves me even me so weak and low end of poem this recording is in the public domain. Jenny Allen by Marietta Holly Read for LibriVox.org by Jule Niedermeyer I never shall hear your voice again, Your voice so gentle and low, But the thought of you, Jenny Allen, Will go with me where I go. Your sweet voice drowns the Atlantic wave and the rush of the Alpine snow. You were very fair, Jenny Allen, fair as a woodland rose. Your heart was pure as an angel's heart, too good for earth and its woes. And I loved you, Jenny Allen, for sorrowful love, God knows. You loved me, Jenny Allen, my sorrow made me wise. And I read your heart, twas an easy task, for within your clear blue eyes, your pure and innocent thoughts shone out, like stars from the summer skies. He had riches and fame with his seventy years, when he won you for his wife. You were but a child, and poor and tired, 
tired of toil and strife and you only thought of rest poor dove when you sold your beautiful life alas for the hour i entered in your halls of lordly mirth for i lost there jenny allen all that gives life worth you taught your teacher jenny the saddest lesson on earth ah woe's the hour i ever stepped your mansion walls within for you loved me jenny allen but you never dreamed twas sin your heart was white as a lily's heart when it drinks the sunshine in god pity me jenny allen that i ever loved you so i would have died to give you peace and i only gave you woe for your eyes looked like a wounded dove's when i told you i must go you were but a child jenny allen but that hour made you wise a woman's grief and holy strength sprang up in your mournful eyes ah you were an angel jenny an angel in woman's disguise but a pitiful pitiful look jenny your sarah features wore as i left you that dark autumn morn left you for evermore and heaven seemed shut against me as i blindly shut that door the years have rained on you golden gifts you dwell in a queenly show there are jewels of price in your silken hair and upon your neck of snow do you ever think of me jenny and the dream of the long ago I have set me down under foreign skies, a fire with an orient glow. I have seen the moon gild the desert sand, and silver the arctic snow. But the thought of you, Jenny Allen, goes with me where I go. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Unseen City by Marietta Holly Read for LibriVox.org by Christine G Not far away does that bright city stand, Tis but a mist over its dividing stream, That wraps the glory of its glittering strand, Its radiant skies and mountain silvery gleam. Oh, often in the blindness of our fate, We wander very near the city's gate. We love that unseen city, and we yearn, ever within our earthly homes to see its golden towers that in the sunset burn its white walls rising from the quiet sea its mansions gleaming with immortal glow filled with the treasures lost to us below yes dear ones that we loved and lost are there right in that fair clime beam those sweet eyes now fanned by its soft breeze floats the shining hair hair we have smoothed back from the gentlest brow Softest white hands we kissed and clasped in ours, Slipped from our grasp, lured by its glowing flowers. Fairer it seems, its velvet walks were sweet, Dearer its quiet streets with gold paved over, Since over them lightly falls the little feet, The light feet bounding through our homes no more. O oh, hearts dear music tearfully missed, That city's filled with melody like this. It is not far away, down from it arches roll, Anthems too sacred for the outward air, Pouring their haunting sweetness on the soul. Oh, how our waiting spirits thrill to hear, In listening to the low bewildering strain, Voices they said we should not hear again. Oh, dear to us that city, he is there, He whom unseen we love, no need of light. His tender eyes illuminate the crystal air, Where his beloved walk in vesture white. What though on earth they wandered poor distressed, and saw through tears his glory, now they rest. O oh, that fair city shining over the tide, Thither we journeyed through the storm and night, But soon shall we adown its still bay glide, Soon will the city's gate gleam on our sight, There with our own for ever shall we be, In that fair city racing from the sea. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Wages of Sin by Marietta Holly. 
Read for LibriVox.org by Lynn Thompson. I am an outcast, sinful and vile, I know. But what are you, my lady, so fair and proud and high? The fringe of your robe just touched me, me so low. Your feet defiled, I saw the scorn in your eye, and the jewelled hand that drew back your garments fine. What should you say if I told you, to your face, your robes are dyed with as deep a stain as mine? The only difference is, you are better paid for disgrace. You loved a man, you promised to be his bride. Strong vows you gave, you were in the sight of heaven his wife. And when you sold yourself for another's wealth, he died. And what is that but murder? To take a life, that is a little beyond my guilt, I ween. To murder the one you love is a crime of deeper grade than mine. Yet in purple you walk on the earth a queen. I think the wages of sin are very unequally paid. For what did you receive when you sold yourself for his gold? When with guilty loathing you plighted your white false hand? A palace in town and country, his name long centuries old. A carriage with coachman and footman, Wealth in broad tracts of land, wealth in coffers and vaults, high station, the family gems. For these you stood at God's altar and swore to a lie. But smother your conscience to silence if it condemns. With this you are liberally paid for your life of infamy. What wages did I receive when I gave myself for his love, so young, so weak, and loving him, loving him so? What did I get for my sin, O oh, merciful God above? But the terrible, terrible wages, pain and want and woe, the world's scorn and my own contempt and disdain, the hideous hue of guilt that stares in every eye. Like you, I cannot broider with gold my garment's stain. You see, my lady, you get far better wages than I. In your constancy to sin you far exceed my power, since that day marked with blackness from other days, the day before your marriage. Never since that hour have I heard his voice, have I looked upon his face, for I threw his gold at his feet and stole away, anywhere, anywhere, only out of his sight, longing to hide from the mocking glare of the day, longing to cover my eyes for ever away from the light. And long I strove to hate him, for I thought I was so young, a friendless orphan left to his care. It was a terrible sin that he had wrought, and since I had the burden of guilt to bear, it was enough without the wild despair of love. So I strove to reason my passionate love to hate. Can we kneel with tears and bid the strong sun move away from the sky? It is vain to war with fate. That a hard life I have lived since then, tis true. My hands are unblackened by sinful wages since that day, and my baby died. I was not fit, God knew, to guide a sinless soul, so he took my bird away. And my heart was empty and lone as a robin's winter nest, with the trusting eyes that never looked scornfully. The head that nestled fearlessly on my guilty breast, and the little constant hands that clung to me, even me but i knew it were best for god to unclasp her hand from mine while yet she clung to it in trust than for her to draw it from me live to understand blush for her mother had she lived she must and then she had her father's smile and his soft dark eyes maybe she would have had his fair false ways his heart it is well that she passed through the starry gate of the skies Though it closed and bars us for ever and ever apart For I am a sinful woman well I know and though by other sins my own are not excused Things seem so strange to me in this strange world of woe in a maze of doubt and wonder I get confused whether a sin of impulse born of a fatal love is worse than deliberate bargain a life of legal shame legal below I think in the courts above the heavenly scribes will call a crime by its right name But we stand before the wise wise judgment seat of the world and it calls you pure 
that in your pearl-gemmed breast all saintly virtues meet holier than other holy women higher truer so sweet a creature an angel in woman's guise they would not wonder much though much they might admire should you be caught again up to your native skies from the alien world in a chariot of fire so we stand before the tender judgment seat of the world and it calls me vile so low that it is a wonder god will let his joyous sunshine gild my guilty head with its smiles an outcast barred beyond the pale of hope beyond the lamp of their mercy's flickering light they would scarcely wonder if the earth should ope and swallow up the wretch from their vexed sight before another judgment seat one day we will stand you and i my lady and he by our side he who won my heart who held my life in his hand he who bought you with gold to be his bride before an assembled world we shall stand we three to meet from the merciful judge our doom of weal or woe he holds his righteous balance true and evenly and which is the vilest sinner we then shall know end of poem this recording is in the public domain Isabel and I by Marietta Holly read for LibriVox.org by Bruno Golus. Isabel has gold and lands. Fate gave her a fair lot, like the white lilies of the field. Her soft hands toil not. I gaze upon her splendor without an envious sigh. I have no wealth in lands and gold, and yet sweet peace have I. I know the blue sky smiles as bright on the low field violet as on the proud crest of the pine on loftiest mountain set. I am content. God loveth all, and if he tenderly the sparrow guides, he knoweth best the place where I should be. Her violet velvet curtains trail down to the floor, but brightly God's rich sunshine streams into my cottage door and not a picture on her walls hath beauty unto me, like that which from my window-frame I daily lean to see. She has known such pomp, she careth not for any humble sight, flowers bending over the brook's green edge to give her no delight. She tends her costly eastern bird with gold upon its wing, but her wild roses bloom for me, for me, her wild birds sing. She tires of home, and fain would see the brightest clime of earth, and so she sails for summer lands with friends to share her mirth. She waves her jeweled hand to me, the opal spray clouds fly. She leaves me with a fading shore. Do I envy her? Not I. She will see the sailor's hardened palms curbing the toiling sails, she will faint beneath the tropic calms and face the angry gales. She will labor for her happiness, while I've no need to speak. But on a lotus leaf I float unto the land they seek. There, like a dream from out the wave, I see a city rise. I stand entranced as by a spell upon the bridge of sighs. The low and measured dip of oars falls softly on my ear, blent with the tender evening song of some swart gondolier. And down from marble terraces veiled ladies slowly pass, and entering antique barges glide down the streets of glass, and eyes filled with dew and fire of their own midnight sky gleam full on me as silently. The gondolas float by. The sunset burns and turns the wave to an enchanted stream, and far up on the shadowy steeps the white-walled convents gleam. The music of their bells float out. The sweet wind bears it by, adown the warm and sunny slopes where purple vineyards lie. And I stand in old cathedrals, by tombs of buried kings. White angels bend above them, 
mute guard with folded wings. Far down the aisle, the organ peals, the priests are knelt in prayer, and memories flood its ancient walls as the music fills the air. I may not see that blessed land, but she roams o'er the sod. The Lord's pure eyes have hallowed where once his feet have trod. Yet he in his mercy has drawn near. He has me comforted. So near he seemed, I almost felt his hand upon my head. And I with slow and reverent steps through ancient cities roam, treading o'er crumbling columns the dust of spire and dome. The tall and shattered arches their flickering shadows cast like bent and hoary spectres, low murmurings of the past. And Isabel toils o'er the Alps through fields of ice and snow to see the lofty glaciers flash in the sun's red glow. I feel no cold, and yet on high their shining spires I see. Why should I envy Isabel? Why should she pity me? Why should I envy Isabel when thus so easily upon a tropic flower's perfume I float across the sea? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Goodbye by Marietta Holly Read for LibriVox.org By Ian King Again I see that May moon shine Dost thou remember, soul of mine? I held your hand in mine, you know And as I bent to whisper low A tender light was in your eye Sweetheart, goodbye Sweetheart, goodbye There came a time my lips were white beneath the pale and cold moonlight, and burning words I might not speak, you read, love, in my ashen cheek. As my whole heart breathed in this one cry, Sweetheart, goodbye, sweetheart, goodbye. Time's waves that roll so swift and fleet have borne you far from me, my sweet, have borne you to a sunny bay, where brightest sunshine gilds your way. Do these words ever dim your sky? Sweetheart, goodbye. Sweetheart, goodbye. I cannot tell, but this I know. They go with me where'er I go. I hear them in the crowded mart. At midnight, lone, they chill my heart. They dim for me the earth and sky. Sweetheart, goodbye. Sweetheart, Goodbye. And in that hour of mystery, when loved ones shall bend over me, near ones to kiss my lips and weep, as nearer steals the dreamless sleep, from all I'll turn with this last sigh. Sweetheart, goodbye. Sweetheart, goodbye. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Sea Captain's Wooing by Marietta Holly. Read for LibriVox.org by Diana Schmidt. Put the crown of your love on my forehead, its sweet links clasped with a kiss. And all the great monarchs of England never wore such a gem as this. Give me your hand, little maiden, that scepter so pearly white, and I'll envy not the kingliest want that ever waved in might. I know tis like asking a morning cloud with a grim old mountain to stay, but your love would soften its ruggedness and melt its roughness away. I have seen a delicate rosy cloud, a rough great cliff enfold, till his heart was warmed by its loveliness and his brow was tinged with its gold. O oh, poor and mean does my life show, 
compared with the beauty of thine like a diamond embedded in granite your life would be set in mine but a faithful love should guard you and shelter you from life's storm the rock must be shivered to atoms ere its treasure should come to harm how your sweet face has shone on me from the tropics midnight sea when the sailor slept and i kept watch alone with my god and thee i know your heart is relenting the tender look in your eyes seems like that sky's soft splendor when the sun was beginning to rise you need not veil their glorious light with your eyelids cloud of snow a tell-tale bird with a crimson wing on your cheek flies to and fro and whispers to me such blissful hope that my foolish tears will start ah little bird your fluttering wing is folded on my heart end of poem this recording is in the public domain Eown by Marietta Holly, read for LibriVox.org by Christine G. I might strive as well to melt to softness the soulless breast of some fair and saintly image carved out of stone, with my smile as to stir your heart from its icy rest, or win a tender glance from your royal eyes, Eown. But your sad smile lures me on, as toward some fatal rock. Is the fond wave drawn but to break with passionate moan? break to be spurned from its cold feet with a stormy shock as you would spurn your suppliant heart from your feet i own i own there is a grave in the churchyard under the hill the villagers shun like the unblessed haunt of a ghost dropped there out of a dark spring night i remember still for a foreign ship had anchored that night on the coast on the grey stone tablet is written this one word rest did he who sleeps underneath seek for it vainly here what is the secret hidden there in the buried breast, the secret deeper sunken by dripping rains each year? When autumn's bending boughs and harvest burden the ground, an early labourer chancing to pass the way alone, saw a small glow gleaming whitely upon the mound, and into the delicate wrist was woven, I own. And he said as he dropped it again his eye did mark, for this unknown, unhallowed grave that had been shunned by all, a narrow footpath winding through the lofty wall, that guards the wild grandeur and gloom of your father's park. Tis well to put small faith in a simple rustic eye, the story your father heard and hotly denied. The grass waves rankly now and gives the fellow the lie. How many secrets the tall, deceitful grasses hide, patting the turf that covers a maiden's innocent rest, and creeping and winding old haunted ruins among, as silently smooths the mould above the murdered breast smothering down to deep silence a buried wrong in your father's gallery once i saw your pictured face i own you were not always so sad and pale as this no beauty in all the long line of your noble race had i so softly bathed in bright bewitchment of bliss you were just nineteen they said it was painted in spain the year before you came it was on your foreign tour by an artist too low to be reached by your disdain a delicate, passionate-hearted boy, proud and poor. So said the rumours floating to us across the sea. You had only an invalid mother with you there. I fancy that then you set your heart's pure feelings free, for the first time far from your proud father's care. For you used to wander down the shaded garden ways, your slight hand closely clasped by the fair-haired English youth, his blue eyes bent on your blushing face, so rumour says, though such light birds are not to be trusted much in truth. Your face is not the face that looked from the antique frame. I own, and even that is gone from the oaken wall, that picture that never was painted for gold or fame, so vow the artist friend who went with me to the hall. But the pain on your white brows it's regally I ween, the smile on your perfect lips is perilously sweet. My slavish glances crown you, my love, my fate, my queen as you pass in peerless beauty adown the village street. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Summer Days by Marietta Holly Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson Like emerald lakes the meadows lie, and daisies dot the main. The sunbeams from the deep blue sky drop down in golden rain, 
and gild the lily's silver bell and coax buds apart but i miss the sunshine of my youth the summer of my heart the wild birds sing the same glad song they sang in days of yore the laughing rivulet glides along low whispering to the shore and its mystic water turns to gold the sunbeam's quivering dart but i miss the sunshine of my youth the summer of my heart the south wind murmurs tenderly to the complaining leaves the flower queen gorgeous tapestry of rose and purple weaves yes nature's smile the wary smile wears all its olden truth but i miss the sunshine of my heart the summer of my youth end of poem this recording is in the public domain The Lady Cecile by Marietta Holly, read for LibriVox.org by Bruno Golus. Sitting alone in the windy tower, while the waves leap high or are low at rest, what does she think of hour by hour, with her strange eyes bent on the distant west, and a fresh white rose on her withered breast? What does she think of hour by hour, the Lady Cecile? Lo, under the lattice, day by day, white homeward sails like swallows come, but the sad eyes look afar and away, and the sailor's songs, as they near their home, no glance may win, for she sitteth dumb, with her sad eyes looking afar and away. The Lady Cecile. Just forty years has she dwelt alone with an ancient servant, grim and grey, sat alone under sun and moon. But once each year on the third of June she treads the creaking staircase down, but back in her tower with the tying day is the Lady Cecile. Beneath the tower of the lonesome hall stone stairs creep down where the slow tide flows. There, out of a niche in the mouldering wall, low leaneth a royal tropical rose. Who set it there? None cares nor knows. Long years ago in the mouldering wall, but the Lady Cecile. But each third of June, as the sun dips low, she descends the stairs to the water's verge, and plucks a rose from the lowest bough, which the lapping waves almost submerge, and what forms out of the deep resurge to vex her, maybe, with mournful brow, knows the Lady Cecile. Her locks are sewn with silver hairs, and the face they shroud is pale and wan. Once it was sweet as the rose she wears, though the perfect lips wore a proud disdain. But the rose face paled by time and pain. No new springs know, like the flower she wears, the Lady Cecile. Why does she set the fresh white rose so faithfully over her silent breast? And what her thoughts are nobody knows. She sits with her secret hid, unguessed, with her strange eyes bent on the distant west, so the slow years come and the slow year goes, or the Lady Cecile. Forty years, and June the third came with a storm, loud the winds did blow, and up in her tower the lady heard the deep waves calling her far below, wild they leaped and surged, wild the winds did blow, and listening alone she thought she heard, Cecile, Cecile. And wrapping her cloak round her withered form, she crept down the stairs of crumbling stone. Higher and fiercer raged the storm as she bent and plucked the rose, but one had the tempest spared, and the winds did moan, and she thought she heard o'er the voice of the storm, Cecile, Cecile. She placed the rose on her bloodless breast, and dizzy and faint she reached the tower, and her strange eyes looked out again on the west and a wave dashed up as she looked from the tower, like a hand, and lifted the roots of the flower and swept it, carried it out to the west from the Lady Cecile. And like death was her face, 
when suddenly, strangely, a tremulous golden gleam pierced the pile of clouds high mast and grey, and the shining, quivering, golden beam seemed a bridge of light, a gold highway thrown o'er the wild waves of the bay. And the Lady Cecile did eagerly out of her lattice lean, with her glad eyes bent on that bridge gold bright, as if some form by her rapt eyes seen were beckoning her down that path of light, that quivering, shining, led from sight, ending afar in the sunset sheen. And the Lady Cecile cried with her lips that erst were dumb, See! Am I not true? Your flower I wore. And her thin hand eagerly touched the flower. He is smiling upon me. Yes, love, I come. And a pleasant light, like the light of home, lit her eyes, and life and pain were o'er to the Lady Cecile. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Home by Marietta Holly, read for LibriVox.org by Jule Niedermeyer. A spirit is out tonight. His steeds are the winds. O oh, list, how he madly sweeps over the clouds and scatters the driving mist. We will let the curtains fall between us and the storm. Wheel the sofa up to the hearth where the fire is glowing warm. Little student, leave your book and come and sit by my side. If you dote on Tennyson so, I'll be jealous of him, my bride. There, now I can call you my own. Let me push back the curls from your brow. And look in your dark eyes and see What my bird is thinking of now. Is she thinking of some high perch Of freedom and lofty flight? You smile, O oh little wild bird, You are hopelessly bound tonight. You are bound with a golden ring, And your captor, like some grim knight, Will lock you up in the deepest cell Of his heart and hide you from sight. Sweetheart, sweetheart, do you hear far away the mournful voice of the sea? It is telling me of the time when I thought you were lost to me. Nay, love, do not look so sad. It is over the doubt and the pain. Hark, sweet, to the song of the fire and the whisper of the rain. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Steps We Climb by Marietta Holly. Read for LibriVox.org by Rinkotsu. 1. Like idle clouds, our lives move on, by change and chance as idly blown. Our hopes, like netted sparrows, fly and vainly beat their wings and die. Fate conquers all with stony will, O oh heart, be still, be still. 2. No, change and chance are slaves that wait on him who guides the clouds, not fate. But the high king rules seas and sun, he conquers, he, the mighty one. So powerless neath that changeless will, O oh heart, be still, be still. 3. As a young bird fallen from its nest beats wildly the kind hand against that lifts it up so tremblingly, our hearts lie in God's hand as he uplifts them by his loving will. O oh heart, be still, be still. 4. Uplifts them to a perfect peace, a rest beyond all earthly ease. Neath the white shadow of the throne, low nest forever overshone. By tenderest love, our Lord's dear will, O oh heart, be still, be still. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.
Squire Percy's Pride by Marietta Holly. Read for LibriVox.org by Diana Schmidt. The squire was none of your common men, whose ancestors nobody knows, but visible was his lineage in the lines of his Roman nose that turned in the true patrician curve, in the curl of his princely lips, in his slightly insolent eyelids, in his pointed fingertips. Very erect and grand looked the squire as he walked o'er his broad estate, for he felt that the earth was honored in bearing his honorable weight. Proudly he strolled through his wooded park, deer-haunted and gloomily grand, or gazed from his pillared porticoes on his far outcrying land. In a tiny whitewashed cottage, half covered with roses wild, his cheerful faced old gardener dwelt, alone with his motherless child. The squire owned the very floor he trod, the grass in his garden lot. The poor man had only this one little lamb, yet he envied the rich man not poor was the gardener yet rich withal in this priceless pearl of a girl so perfect a form so faultless a face never brightened the halls of an earl her eyes were two fathomless stars of light and they shone on the squire day by day till their warm and perilous splendor so melted his pride away that he fain would have taken this pretty pet lamb to dwell in his stately fold, to fetter it fast with a jeweled chain, and cage it with bars of gold. But this coy little lamb loved its freedom. Not so free was she, though, to be true. But, oh, the dainty and shy little lamb, well her master's voice she knew. T'was vain for the squire the story to tell of his riches and high descent, as it fell into one rosy shell of an ear, out of its mate it went. How one grim old ancestor into the land with William the Conqueror came, she thought the sweet of a conqueror she knew with that very name. So in this tender conflict the great man was forced to yield to the handsome sunburnt plowman who sowed and reaped in his field. For vainly he poured out his glittering gifts vainly he pled and besought her heart was a tender and soft little heart but it was not a heart to be bought so strange a thing i warrant you happens not every day that the pride that had thriven for centuries one slight little maiden should slay why the proud squire's roman features quivered and burned with shame and the picture of his grim ancestor blushed in its antique frame. Were this a romance, an idle tale, the squire would sicken and die, slain by the pitiless cruelty of her dark and dazzling eye, and she in some shadowy convent would bow her beautiful head, but the hand that should have told penitent beads wore a plain gold ring instead. And he, not twice had his oak trees bloomed ere he wedded a lady grand whose tall and towering family tree had for ages darkened the land twas a famous genealogical tree with no modernly thrifty shoots but a tree with a sap of royalty and crusting its mossy old roots this leaf he plucked from the outmost twig was somewhat withered tis true long years had flown since it lightly danced to the summer air and the dew not much of a dowry brought she in beauty or vulgar pelf but she had two or three ancestors more than the squire himself twas much to muse o'er their musty names and to think that his children's brains should be moved by the sanguine current that had flown through such ancient veins but I think sometimes in his secret heart the squire breathed woeful sighs, for the fresh sweet face of the little maid with the dark and wonderful eyes. But she no bird ever sang such songs to its mate from contented nest as this wee waiting wife when the twilight was treading the glorious west. 
as she looked through the clustering roses for the manly form that would come up through the cool green evening fields to the sweet little wife and home she could see the great stone mansion towering over the oak's dark green and the lawn like emerald velvet fit for the feet of a queen but round this brown-eyed princess did love his ermine fold queen was she of a richer realm she had dearer wealth than gold end of poem this recording is in the public domain roses of june by marietta holly read for LibriVox.org by lynn thompson she sat in the cottage door and the fair june moon looked down on a face as pure as its own an innocent face and sweet as the roses dewy white that grow so thick at her feet white royal roses fit for a monarch's crown and one is clasped in her slender hand and one on her bosom lies and two rare blushing buds loop up her light brown hair ah roses of june you never looked on a face so white and fair such perfectly moulded lips such sweet and heavenly eyes this low-walled home is dear to her she has come to it to-day from the lordly groves of her palace home afar but not to stay there's a light on her brow like the light of a star and her eyes are looking beyond the earth far far away she was born in this cottage home the sweetest rosebud of spring and grew with its flowers the fairest blossom of all till her friends ambitiously said she would grace the kingliest hall and flattery breathed on her ear its passionate whispering a man of riches and taste saw the maiden's face and thought her beauty would grace his stately southern home so he took her there with pictures from france and statues of rome and marvellous works of art from many an ancient place he decked her in costly attire and showed her beauty with pride as for sympathy and love what need of these had she he had placed her amidst the choicest treasures of land and sea his marble hebe never complained and why should his bride he had polished the beautiful unknown gem and set it in gold he had given her his name and his wealth what more could she ask when all other gifts were hers it was surely an easy task her pleading spirit's restless wings to fold the wise world called her blessed so heart be still she had beauty and splendour and youth and a husband calmly kind and crowds of flattering friends her lofty mansion lined and dark-browed slaves awaited her queenly will why should she dream of the past of the days of old of her childhood home and more oft of the home of the dead of the grave where she went alone the night before she was wed and knelt with her pure cheek pressed to the marble cold it was not sin she said that those eyes of darkest blue haunted her dreams more wildly from day to day since they looked on heaven now and she was so far away she could love the dead and still be to the living true she could think of him the one who loved her best of him who true had been if all the world deceived who felt all grief with her when she was grieved and shared each joy that thrilled her girlish breast it was not sin that she heard that voice gentle and deep and the echo of a name it was cut in marble now so it was not sin she said as she breathed it low in the midnight hour when all but she was asleep but she wearier grew of pride and pomp like a homesick child she pined and paler grew her cheek as worn with a wearing pain she said the fresh free country air would seem so sweet again so she went to her childhood home as a pilgrim goes to a shrine and she looked down the orchard path and the meadow's clover bloom she stood by the stone-walled well that had mirrored her face when a child she saw where the robins built and her roses clambered wild and lingered lost in thought in each low and rustic room and she sat in the cottage door while the fair june moon looked down 
on a face as pure as its own an innocent face and sweet as the roses wet with dew that grew so thick at her feet white royal roses fit for a monarch's crown but at night when silence and sleep on the lonely hamlet fell like a spirit clad in white through the graveyard gate she passed and the stars bent down to hear i have come to you love at last while through the valley solemnly sounded the midnight bell and her southern birds will wait her coming in vain their starry eyes impatiently pierce the palm tree's shade and her roses droop in their bowers alone they'll wither and fade roses of june you are gone but we know you will blossom again end of poem this recording is in the public domain magdalena by marietta holly read for LibriVox.org by noel badrian who falsely called thee destroyer still white angel of death o oh, not a destroyer here but a kind restorer thou for the guilty look is gone died out with her failing breath and the sinless peace of a babe has come to lip and brow drowned in the heaving tide with her life is her burden of woe the dreary weight of sin the woeful troublesome years the cold pure touch of the water has washed the shame from her brow leaving a calm immortal that looks like the chrism of peace i fancy her smile was like this as she pulled at her mother's gown drawing her out with childish fingers to watch the red of the skies on the old brown doorstep of home while the peaceful sun went down with her mother's hand on her brow and the glow of the west in her eyes an outcast vile and lost you say yes she went astray astray when the crimson wine of life ran fresh and wild with mother's tender hand no more on her brow put away the grasses beneath and she was alone and almost a child like a kid decoyed to its death the stealthy panther lures mocking the voice of its dam thus he led the innocent child through her tenderness down to ruin he is a friend of yours and admired by all as you say men will be wild but i wonder if god so far above on his great white throne the clanging tumult of trouble and doubt that mortals vex when the murmur of a crime sweeps up from earth with woeful moan if he pauses ere he condemns to ask the offender's sex and if so whether the weaker or stronger he blames the most the tempter or tempted a tide of his tender compassion claims whether the selfish or too unselfish those who through love or lust are lost he in his infinite wisdom and mercy most condemns frown not i know her evil our womanly nature shuns turns from with shuddering horror but now so low is her head for god's sake woman remember your own little ones lying safely at home in their snow-white sheltered bed your own little girls for them does the flame of your anger burn such creatures will draw down innocence into guilt and woe i think from eternity vast she will scarcely return to entice them to sin you can safely forgive her now you will not countenance wrong but fiercely war for the right even unto the bitter death very good you should do so but my friend if your own secret thought had blossomed to light in temptation you might have been in this outcast's place you know so let us be pitiful grateful that god's strong hand has held our own and the tale of a woman's despair and penitent sin he stooped and wrote in the perishing sand we carved the record in stone 
weak, sinful souls that we are. In the arms of the kind all-mother, but close to the sorrowful wave, with its voice no longer moaning to her a despairing call, but a dirge deploring and deep, we will make her grave with healing grasses above her, and God over all. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. My Angel This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dom Bombadil Poems by Marietta Holly My Angel Last night she came unto me, and kneeling by my side, laid her head upon my bosom, my beautiful, my bride, my lost one, with her soft dark eyes and waves of sunny hair. I smoothed the shining tresses with tearful fond caresses and words of thankful prayer. And then a thrill of doubt and pain my jealous heart swept over. We were parted, she was dwelling, upon a far-off shore. Yet he who made my sad heart new, I loved her more and more. My love more true and perfect grew, as each dark day passed o'er. But she whose heart had been my own, who loved me tenderly, whose last low words I knelt to hear, where, how can I leave thee? And death would seem as sweet as life, could we together be now though we two were parted by such a distant wide by such a strange and viewless realm by such a boundless tide her gentle face was radiant with a surpassing bliss she was happier in that distant land than she ever was in this and in some other tenderness some other love divine she had found the peace and happiness she never found in mine so with a tender chiding i could not quite suppress though well my darling knew i would not make her pleasure less are you happy love i said are you happy love without me then she raised her gentle head and twined her arms round me yet while my tears fell faster beneath her mute caress her face had all the glory of a sainted soul at rest and her voice was sweet as music i am happy I am blessed. Do you know how lonely-hearted I have been each weary day, praying that each passing hour would bear my life away, that we might be united upon the distant shore? Lawrence, we are not parted. I am with you evermore. I cannot see you, darling. Your face I cannot see. Can you see the moon's white fingers that leads the pleading sea? Can you see the fragrance lingering where summer roses be? The soft winds tender clasping the close and wrapping air, enfolding you, O oh Lawrence, I am with you everywhere. Then, while her face grew brighter as with a heavenly glow, in tenderness unspeakable, she kissed my lips and brow. Then I lost her, then she left me. As at the set of day, the snowy clouds float outward and melt in light away. I heard low strains of melody no earthly choir could sing. A light breath floated past me as from a gliding wing. And on my darkened spirit there fell so bright a gleam. I knew the blessed vision was not in truth a dream. Though death had won from my embrace my beautiful, my bright, I had won a richer treasure an angel by my side. The Father careth for us all, in pity, and I know, my love is not forever gone from him who loved her so. When a few more days have drifted the shadows over me, when the golden gates are lifted, my angel I shall see. Her veiled face in its glory upon my gaze will rise, and heaven will shine upon me through the sweetness of her eyes. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.
Grief by Marietta Holly. Read for LibriVox.org by Christine G. What though the Eden morns were sweet with song, passing all sweetness that our thought can reach, crushing its flowers, noon's chariot moved along, in brightness far transcending mortal speech. Yet in the twilight shades did God appear, a welcome shadow so that he draw near. Prosperity is flushed with papal ease, and grants indulgence to pride of word, robing our soul in pomped and vanities. Ah, no fit dwelling for our gentle lord, grief rends those draperies of pride and sin, and so our lord will deign to enter in. Then carefully we curb each thought of wrong, we walk more softly, with more reverent feet, as in his presence chamber hush our tongue and in the holy quiet, solemn, sweet, we feel his smile, we hear his voice so low, so we can bless him that he gave us woe. What cares the sailor in the sheltered cove, from the past peril of the stormy sea? Dare from grief storm the haven of his love, and so he bringeth us where we would be. We trust in him, we lean upon his breast, who shall make trouble when he giveth rest. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Wild Oats by Marietta Holly Read for LibriVox.org by Sandra Schmidt Wild Oats O gay young husbandman, would you be sure of a crop upspringing rankly, an abundant and bountiful yield? Go forth in the morning, and sow on your life's broad field this pleasantly odorous seed. Then smooth the ground on top, or leave it rough, with the utmost undeceit. Never you fear, it will thriftily thrive and grow, loading the harvest's plain beneath your feet with the ripened sheaves of shame, remorse, and woe. You have but to sow the seed, no care will it want, for he who soweth tears, while the husbandman sleeps, taketh unwearied pains. A vigilant guard he keeps, tirelessly watching and tending each evil plant these are his pleasure gardens least to him through time where he walketh to and fro chanting a demon song tending with ghastly fingers the scarlet buds of wrong and drinking greedily in the sweet perfume of crime and of all the seeds the one that thriftiest thrives is the colour of ruby wine when it flashes high, who would think the tiny seed so fair to the eye could cast such a deadly shade over countless lives and branch out into murder in one springing shoot? Thrifty branches of sin, bristling with thorns of woe, shadowing graves where broken hearts lie low, and minds that were godlike lowered beneath the brood. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Autumn by Marietta Holly Read for LibriVox.org by Bruno Golus How the sumac banners bent, dripping as if with blood! What a mournful presence brooded upon the slumberous air! A mockingbird screamed noisily in the depth of the silent wood, and in my heart was crying the raven of despair, thrilling my being through with its bitter, bitter cry. It were better to die, it were better to die. For she, my love, my fate, she sat by my side on a fallen oak, her cheek all flushed with a bashful shame, telling me what her innocent heart had hid. For was I not her brother, her dear brother, all but in name? I listened to her low words, but turned my face away, away from her eyes' soft light and the mocking light of the day. He was noble and proud, she said, and had chosen her from all the haughty ladies and great. She didn't deserve her lot. I knew her peer could never be found in palace or hall, and my white face told my thought. But she saw it not. 
She was crushing some scarlet leaves in her dainty fingers of snow, her maiden joy crowning her face with a radiant glow. She had wanted me to know, and then a smile and a blush. Her smile was always just like a baby's smile, and the red came to her cheek at a word or a glance, then there fell a hush. She was waiting some word from me, I knew, so I said, May heaven bless you both, words spoken full quietly. And she, God bless her, never knew how much they cost to me. How the sumac banners bent, dripping as if with blood. What a mournful presence brooded upon the slumbrous air. A mocking bird screamed noisily in the depths of the silent wood, and my heart was crying the raven of despair, thrilling my being through with its desolate, desolate cry. It were better to die. It were better to die. The white dawn follows the darkness. Out of the year's decay shineth the golden fire that gildeth the autumn with light. From another's sin and loss cometh this good to me. By another's fall am I raised to this blissful height. Let me be humble, said my heart, as from her sweet lips fell. Let a prayer for him arise with the sound of our marriage bell. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Fairest Land by Marietta Holly. Read for LibriVox.org by Bruno Golus. Twas a bleak dull moor that stretched before the low stone porch of the cottage door, and standing there was youth and maid. He for long journeying seemed arrayed, and the sunset flamed in the burnished west, and a proud throb beat in the young man's breast as he whispered, Sweet, will you come to me? In that fairer land beyond the sea? The wonderful western land, In dreams I have seen its prairies green, And gleams of its shining waterfalls, Valleys fair, And a voice in my dreams has called me there, Where man is man, and not a clod, And must bend the knee to none but God. A home will I make for thee and me, In that fairer land beyond the sea. But the cruel seas where the fated ships go down to their doom. But he kissed the lips, the trembling lips, till they smiled again. And his bright hopes cheered her heart's dull pain. And she laid her head on his hopeful breast, and looked with him to the glowing west, and said, I will come, I will come to thee, to that fairer land beyond the seas. And the crimson light changed to daffodil, to ashen grey, but they stood there still, and high o'er the west shone the evening star as he pictured that home afar. The peace and bliss are own at last, when this dreary parting all is past. When my heart's dear love, you come to me in that fairer land beyond the sea. So he sailed, but saddest is alway not for those who go, but for those who stay, and her sweet eyes gathered a shadow dim as days went by with no news of him, and weeks and months, but at last it came, as the grey moor shone with the sunset flame, her quick eyes glanced the strange lines o'er, then she fell like dead on the cottage floor. T'was a stranded ship on a rocky coast, one true brave heart when hope was lost, how he toiled till all the shore had gained, and only a baby form remained on ship, how he breasted the surging tide, with death a-wrestling side by side, how he lifted the child to its mother's knee, as a great wave washed him out to sea. And for days the maid in the cottage door sat and looked o'er the dreary moor, her cheeks grew white neath her blinding tears, 
and the sunset rays seemed cruel spears that pierced her heart, and ashen grey turned the earth and sky, the night, the day. But at last a star shone high above, the tender star of the heavenly love. For as her life ebbed day by day, the high country, the fair alway, rose for her eyes the safe, sweet home, and she seemed to hear, Love, will you come? And so one eve, when a bridge of gold seemed spanning the last sea dim and cold, she went to him, for I to be in the fairest land beyond the sea. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Messenger by Marietta Hawley, read for LibriVox.org by Amy Graymore. Is his form hidden by some cliff or crag, or does he loiter on the shelving shore? We know not, though we know he waits for us, somewhere upon the road that lies before. And when he bids us, we must follow him, must leave our half-drawn nets, our houses, lands, and those we love the most and best, ah, they, in vain will cling to us with pleading hands. He will not wait for us to gird our robes, and be they white as saints or soiled and dim, we can but gather them around our form and take his icy hand and follow him. Oh, will our palm cling to another palm, loath, loath to lose our hold of love's warm grasp, or shall we free our hand from the hand of grief and reach it gladly out to meet his clasp? Sometimes I marvel when we too shall meet, when I shall hear that stealthy step and see the unseen form that haunteth mortal dreams, the stern-browed face, the eyes of mystery. Shall I be waiting for some wished-for wealth, impatient by the shore of a purple sea? But when the vessel's keel grates on the sand, will he lean down its side and call to me? Shall I in thymy pastures cool and sweet see the lark soaring through the rosy air? And then will his dark face look down on me neath the white splendor of the morning star? Shall I be resting from the noonday blaze in the rich summer of a blossoming land and idly glancing through the lotus leaves behold the shadow of his beckoning hand? Or in some inland village shaded deep with silence brooding o'er the quiet place Shall I look from some lattice crowned with flowers in the calm twilight and behold his face? Or shall I over such a lonely way beset with fears my weary footsteps wend, so desolate that I shall greet his face with joy as a desired and welcome friend? Oh, little matters it when we shall meet upon the quiet shore or on the sea, if he shall lead us to the golden gate, dear Lord, if he shall lead us unto thee. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sleep by Marietta Holly, read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson. Come, gentle sleep with the holy night. Come with the stars and the white moonbeams. Come with your train of handmaids bright, blessed and beautiful dreams. Bring the exile to his home again. Let him catch the gleam of its low white wall. Let his wife cling to his neck and weep, and his children come to their father's call. Give to the mother the child she lost, laid from her heart to a clay-cold bed. Let its breath float over her tear-wet cheek and her cold heart warm neath its bright young head. Take the sinner's hand and lead him back to his sinless youth and his mother's knee. Let him kneel again neath her tender look and murmur the prayer of his infancy. Lead the aged into the wondrous clime, home of their youth and land of their bliss. Let them forget in that beautiful world the sin and the sorrow of this. And gently lead my love, my own, tenderly clasp her snow-white hand, wrap her in garments of soft repose, and lead her into your mystic land. Let your fairest handmaids bow at her feet, her path o'er your loveliest roses be. 
and let all the flowers with their perfumed lips whisper of me come gentle sleep with the holy night come with the stars and the white moonbeams come with your train of handmaids bright blessed and beautiful dreams end of poem this recording is in the public domain The Song of the Siren by Marietta Holly Read for LibriVox.org by Christine G Oh, I am the siren, the siren of the sea, The sea, the wondrous sea, that lies for ever before. I stand a fairy shape upon the shadow of a cliff, Where the water's drowsy ripple laps the phantom of a shore. And oh, so fair, so fair am I, I draw all the hearts to me, For I am the siren, the siren of the sea. All the glory of my golden tresses gleams upon the air, How it falls about my snowy shoulders, round and bare and white. My lips are full of love, as rounded grapes are full of wine, And my eyes are large and languid, and full of dewy light. Oh, I lure the idle landsmen many a league for love of me, For I am the siren, the siren of the sea. Sometimes they press so near that my breath is on their cheek, And their eager hands can almost touch the glowing bowl I bear. They can see the beaded froth, the ruby glitter of the wine. Then I slip from their embraces like a breath of summer air. Oh, I lightly, lightly glide away. They come no nigh me, for I am the siren, the siren of the sea. Sometimes I float along, as standing in a boat, before the ship's becalmed, where dusky sailors stand, and the helmsman drops his oar, and the lookout leaves his glass. So I beckon them, and lure them with the whiteness of my hand. Oh, this the song I sing, will they listen unto me? For I am the siren, the siren of the sea. Would you from toil and labour flee, and float ye out on this wonderful sea, from islands of spies to Cephyrs blow, swaying the galleys to and fro, silken sails and a balmy breeze, shall waft you unto a perfect ease. Fold your hands and rest and rest. The sun sails on from the east to the west. The days will come and the days will go. What good can man for his labour show? In passionless peace come float with me over the waves of this wonderful sea. Would you forget, O sorrowful soul, come and drink of this golden bowl, with jewelled poppies about the rim, drink of the wine that flushes its brim, and drown all your haunting memories there, your woe and your weary care. Oh, I am the siren, the siren of the sea, the sea, the wondrous sea that lies for evermore before. Oh, the mystic music ripples, how they break in rosy spray, but the crystal wave will mock them, they will reach it never more. For it glides away, I glide away, they come no nigher me, for I am the siren, the siren of the sea. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. eighteen sixty two by Marietta Holly read for Liberbox org by Rinkotsu one there's a tear in your eye, little Sybil, gathering large and slow. Oh Sybil, sweet little Sybil, what are you thinking of now? Push back the velvet curtains that darken the lonely room, where shadows peer out of the crimson depths and the statues gleam white in the gloom. How the cannon's thunder rolls along and shakes the lattice and wall. Oh, Sybil, sweet little Sybil, what if your father should fall? The smoky clouds sweep up from the field and darken the earth and sea. God save him, God save him, wherever he may be. 2. Oh, pretty dark-eyed bird of the south with your face so mournful and white. There is many a little northern girl that is breathing that prayer tonight. There's a little girl on the hills of Maine, looking out through the fading light. She looks down the winding path and says, He will surely come tonight. The table is set, the lamp is trimmed, the fire has a ruddy glow that streams like a beacon down the path to the dusky valley below. There is smiling hope on the pretty face, pressed so close to the pane, and her eyes are like blue violets after summer rain. 3. How you tremble, little Sybil, at the cannon's dreadful sound. Did you see far away the fallen steed and its rider prone on the ground? The dark brown locks so low in the dust, the scarf with a crimson stain. 
Oh, Sybil, poor little Sybil, he will not come back again. 4. Right gallantly and well he fought, hand to hand with his brave a foe, their faces hid by the nodding plumes and the dense clouds hanging low. Did they think, these hot-blooded captains, that death was so close by their side? When Howard has fallen, the bravest, rung out on the air far and wide. Howard, his foeman, kneels by his side and raises his head to his knee. O oh God, that brothers should part in youth, and thus should their meeting be. Unheard is the deafening battle roar, unseeing is that dying look. He hears but the sound of a childish laugh and the song of a northern brook. He sees two white forms kneeling in the twilight sweet and dim, one low couch angel guarded by a mother's evening hymn. 5. The angel of death came down with the night, came down with the gathering gloom. God pity the little dark-eyed girl alone in the lonely room. But still by his side his brother kneels, chill horror has frozen his veins. He heeds not the glancing shower of shells that with red fire glitters and rains. And he heeds not the fiery cavalry charge that sweeps like a billow on to death. Oh, the bravest and saddest sight that man ever gazed upon. The last shot, what is one life to the battle's gory gain? But alas, for the little blue-eyed maid away on the hills of Maine. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Weary by Marietta Holly Read for LibriVox.org by Newgate Novelist The clouds that vex the upper deep Stay not the white sail of the moon And lips may moan and hearts may weep The sad old earth goes rolling on O'er smiling vale and sighing lake One shadow cold is overthrown And souls may faint and hearts may break The sad old earth goes rolling on End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Too Low by Marietta Holly. Read for LibriVox.org by Diana Schmidt. My house is thatched with violet leaves and paved with daisies fine. Scarlet berries droop over its leaves, tall grasses round it shine. With softest down I have lined my nest. Securely now I will sit and rest. When their wings break from their silvery shell, Touched by my tender care, Here shall my little ones safely dwell, Little ones soft and fair. Some summer morn they shall try their wings, While their father sits by my side and sings. Hard by, just over the streamlet's edge, A great rock towered in might, High up, half hidden in moss and sedge, were safe little nooks and bright. Ah, well, for the little bird with her tender breast, had she flown to the rock to build her nest? Poor bird, she built her nest too low. Alas, for the bird, alas, that she chose that spot to her woe in the low dewy grass. For the reaper came with his gleaming blade. Alas, for love in the violet shade. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. At Last by Marietta Holly, read for LibriVox.org by Amy Graymore. What though upon a wintry sea our life bark sails? What though we tremble neath its cruel gales, its icy blast? We see a happy port lie far before, we see its shining waves, its sunny shore where we shall wander and forget the troubled past at last no storms approach that quiet shore no night falls on its silver streams and valleys bright and gardens fast within that pleasant land of perfect peace our toil-warm feet shall stay our wandering cease there shall we resting all forget the past at last the sorrows we have hid in silent weariness as birds above a wounded bleeding breast their bright plumes cast the griefs like mourners in a dark array that haunt our footsteps here will flee away and leave us to forget the sorrowful past at last 
voices we loved sound from those far-off lands and thrill our hearts life's golden sands are dropping fast soon shall we meet by the river of peace and say as the night flees before the eye of day so faded from our eyes the mournful past at last end of poem this recording is in the public domain Twilight by Marietta Holly, read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson. Draped in shadows stands the mountain against the eastern sky. Above it the fair summer moon looks downward tenderly, and Venus in the glowing west opens her languid eye. Now the winds breathe softer music, half a song and half a sigh while twilight wraps her purple veil around us silently and our thoughts appear like pictures pictures shaded wondrously quiet landscapes sweet and lonely silvery sea and shadowy glade forests lakes by man forsaken where the white fawn's steps are stayed and contradino's strain neath the pantheon's solemn shade and we see the wave bridged over by the moonlight's mystic link desert wells by tall palms shaded where dusky camels drink while dark-eyed arab maidens fill their pitchers at the brink and secluded convent chapels where veiled nuns kneel to pray with a dim light streaming o'er them through arches quaint and gray while down the long and winding aisles low music dies away there is a starry twilight of the soul, as sadly fair, when our wild emotions are at rest, like the pale nuns at prayer, and our griefs are hushed like sleepers, and put off the robes of care. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Sewing Girl by Marietta Holly, read for LibriVox.org by Dom Bombadil. I asked to see the dead man's face, as I gave the servant my well-filled basket, and she deigned to lead me a wondrous grace, where he lay asleep in his rosewood casket. I was only the sewing girl, and he the heir to this princely palace. Flowers, white flowers everywhere, In odorous cross and anchor and chalice. The smallest leaf might touch his hair, But I, my God, I must stand apart, With my hands pressed silently on my heart. I must not touch the least brown curl, For I was only the sewing girl. If a stately mother knew what I know, as she weeping stood by his side this morning. Would she clasp me in motherly laugh and woe, or drive me out in the cold with scorning? If she knew that I loved him better than life, better than death, since for him I gave my hopes of rest, that I faced life's strife, and renounced the quiet and restful grave, when his strong true hand drew me back that day when woe and want and the want of pity drove me down where the cold waves lie, like wolves round the walls of this cruel city. Not much, would she say with her proud lips curl, only the life of a sewing girl. Now love for me in his heart did linger. I saw the lady his promised bride, I saw his ring on her slender finger, as she weeping stood by his mother's side. That same ring shone as he lifted me, dripping and cold from the sea waves bitter. I had thought heaven's light I next should see, but earth's sun shone in its ruby glitter. I had thought when I looked in the Lord's mild face that he would forgive me my rashness and sin. When he knew there was not a single blaze, not a blaze so small that I could creep in. And I wanted a home, and I longed for love, and God and mother were both above. 
but he showed me my sin and taught me to live above this life of tumult and whirl though i was only a suing girl what shall i do with the life he won from death that day in hard-won battle shall i lay it down near the rising sun looks down on the city's roar and rattle shall i lay it down near the midnight dim with horrible shadows is roofed and paved no i shall make it so pure and sweet that angels shall say with smiles to him when we meet above on the golden street behold the soul of her you saved maybe it shall add to his crown one pearl though only the soul of a suing girl end of poem this recording is in the public domain harry the first by marietta holly read for LibriVox.org by peter yearsley in his armchair warmly cushioned in the quiet earned by labour life's reposeful indian summer grandpa sits and lets the paper lie upon his knee unheeded shine his cheeks like winter apples gleams his smile like autumn sunshine as he looks on little harry first born of the house of graham bravely cutting teeth in silence cutting teeth with looks heroic some deep thought seems moving grandpa ponders he a while in silence then he turns and says to grandma nancy do you think that ever there was such a child before grandma with prim precision the seam stitch impaleth deftly on her sharp and glittering needle then she turns and answers calmly with a deep assurance never was there such a child before papa thinks so but in manly dignity controls his feelings more than half a year a father he must show a cool composure he must stately be if ever but his dark eyes plainly tell it, tell it as he saith proudly, Papa's man is little Harry. Mamma, maybe, does not speak it, but she prints the thoughts on velvet, rosy-hued with fondest kisses, when the pink, soft page is lying folded closely to her bosom. A little father goes his auntie, aged fourteen, age of fancy she looks down the future ages with her wise prophetic vision sees the babies pass before her babies of the twentieth century all the long and dusty ages to the thousand years of glory oh the host of bright-eyed children thronging like the stars at midnight faces sweet and countless as the rose leaves of a thousand summers all the pretty heads so curly that shall hold a riper wisdom than our youthful planet dreams of all the ranks of dimple shoulders that shall move time's rolling chariot nearer to the golden city vieweth these the bright-eyed prophet still the oracle says calmly speaks the seer with golden tresses no there never was nor will be such a child as our harry such a noble boy as harry summer brings a wealth of flowers flowers of every form and colour orange crimson royal purple all along the mountain passes all along the pleasant valley lo the emerald branches bendeth with their weight of summer glory but they do not waken in us half the tender blissful feeling half the pure and sweet emotion as the first spring flower in april with its lashes tinged with crimson partly raised from eyes half timid fearful that the snow will drown it how we love the dainty blossom how we wear it in our bosom just so with the tree ancestral many flowers may blossom on it but the first wee bud that's grafted 
to its heart. Ah, how we love it! Others may be loved as fondly, but they are not loved so proudly, loved so blindly, so entirely. Yes, when first the heart's door opens to the touch of baby fingers, quick the dimpled feet will bear them to the dearest place and warmest. Plenty room enough for other buds of beauty, buds of promise, in the heart's capacious chambers. But the first is firmly settled, little Harry's firmly settled in the centre of affection. Later ones must settle round him. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Criminal's Betrothed by Marietta Holly. Read for LibriVox.org by Peter Yearsley. As on a waveless sea a vessel strikes upon a treacherous rock, waking the sailors from their happy dreams by the swift, terrible shock, dreaming of shaded village streets and home, forgetting the cruel sea till the shock came, so woke I. Yet I know twas love I loved, not he. Tis not the star the wave so wildly clasps, only its form reflected in the stream. Tis not a broken heart I mourn, only a broken dream. I should have died when he was brought so low, had it been him I loved. Died clinging to him, as to the blasted oak the ivy clings unmoved. Twas love that looked on me with strange sweet eyes, burning with marvellous flame. Love was the idol that I worshipped though I gave to it his name. I gave to love his name, his glance, his brow, his low-toned voice, his smile. O oh, soul, be patient. I can sever them, but yet a little while. Before I put away these outward forms, deceiving sweet disguises, which love wore, let my heart break into regretful tears, just once, and then no more. Just once, as fond friends watch the fading sail bearing away a guest of truest worth, they give this little time to grief, and then return to their desolate hearth, and build new fires, and gather dewy flowers, let the pure air into the vacant room, so light and bloom and sweetness all shall penetrate its gloom. I will be patient. In a little time, quiet and full of rest, God's peace will come and, like a soft-winged bird, settle upon my breast. Not always thus shall beat my restless heart, like a wild eagle against its prison bars. In some calm twilight of the future time, I will sit calm-browed underneath the stars. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Gone Before by Marietta Holly Read for LibriVox.org by Peter Yearsley Smooth the hair Silken waves of sunny brown Lay upon the white brow down Crowned with the blossoms rare, Lilies on a golden stream, Ne'er to float in summer air, Wreathed with meadow daisies fair. Lay away the broken crown And your broken dream, With one shining tress of hair, Never more to need your care. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Woman's Heart by Marietta Holly, read for LibriVox.org by Christine G. My heart sings like a bird tonight that flies to its nest in the soft twilight and sings in its brooding bliss. Ah, I so low and he so high. What could he find to love? I cry. Did ever love stoop so low as this? As a miser jealousy counts his gold, I sit and dream of my wealth untold from the curious world apart. 
to sacred my joy for another eye, I treasure it tenderly, silently, and hide it away in my heart. Dearer to me than the costliest crown that ever on queenly forehead shone is the kiss he left on my brow. Would I change his smile for a royal gem, his love for a monarch's diadem? Change it, ah no, ah no! My heart sings like a bird to-night that flies away to its nest of light to brood over its living bliss. Ah, I so low, and he so high, what could he find to love, I cry? Did ever love stoop so low as this? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Warning by Marietta Holly. Read for LibriVox.org by Dom Bombadil. When enwrapped in rosy pleasure, our careless pulses beat with a rhythm sweet, sweet to the music's merry measure. When world waves rise around us, with soft transparent weights, light in seeming yet so great, the liquid chains have bound us. When softly downward falling, we listen, we can hear from a purer atmosphere a warning and a calling. Tis not uttered to our ear. To a spirit it is spoken in the wonderful, unbroken, heavenly speech that spirits hear. Strange and solemn doth it roll, downward like a yearning cry from that belfry far on high, warning, calling to our soul. Ever, ever doth it roll, our angel guards the tower, ringing, ringing every hour, warning, calling to our soul. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Geneve to Her Lover by Marietta Holly. Read for LibriVox.org by Iswa in Belgium in March 2015. I turned the key in this idle hour of an ivory box, and looking low, see only dust, the dust of a flower. The waters will ebb, the waters will flow, and dreams will come, and dreams will go forever. O oh, friend, if you and I should meet beneath the boughs of the bending lime, should you in the same low voice repeat the tender words of the old love rhyme, it could not bring back the same old time, never. When you laid this rose against my brow, I was quite unused to the ways of men, with my trusting heart. I am wiser now. So I smile. Remembering my heart throbs then, The dust of a rose cannot blossom again, Never. The brow that you praised has cold a groan, And hearts will change, I suppose they must. A rose to be lasting should blossom in stone, Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Dead are the rose, the love, and the trust, for ever. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Wild Rose by Marietta Holly Read for LibriVox.org by Christine G. In a waste of yellow sand on the brow of a dreary hill, a slight little slip of a rose struggled up to the light. The seed, maybe, was sown there by the south wind's idle will, but there it grew and blossomed, pale and white. Only one flower it bore, and that was frail and small, but I think it was brave to try to grow at all. It grew so fair cashmere, or sheltered garden of kings, sweet with a thousand flowers, with birds of paradise, fanning her blushing cheeks with their glowing wings, praising her deep in bloom with their great bright eyes. Life would have been a pleasure instead of a toil, to my pale little patient rose of the sandy soil. Did she ever sadly think of her wasted life? folding her one weak hand so helplessly and still, and a great oak by her sheltering glad bird life, and the thirsty meadows praising the running rill. She could hear the happy workday song of the busy brook, while she, poor thing, could only stand and look. Did the wee white rose ever think of her lonely life, that there were none to care if she tried to grow, none to care if the cloud that hung in the west should burst and scatter her pale leaves far and low? 
Did she ever wish that a heavy cloud would fall, and hide her so unblessed from the sight of all? One sky bends over rich garden flowers, and those that dwell in barren soil untended and unblessed, and I think that God was pleased with the small white rose, that tried so patiently to live and do its best, that bravely kept its small leaves pure and fair, on the waste of dreary sand and the desert air. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Our Bird by Marietta Holly. Read for LibriVox.org by Julian Niedermeyer. She lay asleep, and her face shone white, as under a snowy veil, and her waxen hands clasped on her breast were full of snowdrops pale. But a holy calm touched the baby lips, the brow, and the sleeping eyes. The look of an angel pitying us from the peace of paradise. And now, though she lies neath the coffin lid, we cannot think her dead. But we think of her as of some delicate bird to a milder country fled. Twas a long, dark flight for our gentle dove, our bird so tender and fair. But we know she has reached the summer land, and folded her white wings there. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Time That Is To Be by Marietta Holly Read for LibriVox.org by Jule Niedermeyer I am thinking of fern forests that once did towering stand, crowning all the barren mountains, shading all the dreary land. Oh, the dreadful, quiet brooding, the solitude sublime, that reigned like shadowy spectres over the third great day of time. In long, low lines the tideless seas on dull grey shores did break. No song of bird, no gleam of wing, over wood or reedy lake. No flowers perfumed the pulseless air, no stars, no moon, no sun. To tell in silver language, night was past or day was done. Only silence rising with the ghostly morning's misty light. Silence, silence settling down upon the moonless, starless night. On the ferns and giant mosses, noiseless sentinels did stand, looking o'er the tideless ocean, watching o'er the dreary land. Ferns gave place to glowing olives and clusters dropping wine, mosses changed to oaken tissues and cleft to fragrant pine. Deft and noiseless fingers toiled and wrought the great creator's plan, through countless ages moulding earth for the abode of man, till each imperial day was bound by sunset's crimson bars, the purple columns of the night crowned with the shining stars. The ripe fruit seeks the sunlight through all the clustering leaves. The earth is stacked with golden maize and costly yellow sheaves. Countless silent centuries passed in fashioning good that doth appear. Shall we weary and grow hopeless, waiting for the golden year? Thy kingdom come, in which thy will is done. From myriad souls rises the yearning cry. Scatter palm boughs, behold a brighter sun shall dawn in splendour in a clearer sky. Upon the distant hills a glow we see that tells us of the time that is to be. The desert then shall blossom like the rose, the almond flourish on the rocky slopes, wisdom and beauty in rare union close, making earth beautiful beyond our hopes. High in the dusky east a star we see, a herald of the time that is to be. The free-born soul shall not be captive then, bound by decaying cords of narrow creeds. God's image shall more clearly shine in men 
divinely shaped by holy aims and deeds gleam golden star o gleam o'er earth and sea a herald of the time that is to be fetters are broken so the fern leaves fall a richer growth is budding wondrous fair the flower of liberty shall bloom for all and all shall breathe the healing of the air the blessed air that wraps a people free within that glorious time that is to be for what is slavery but woe and crime and freedom is but liberty from these o perfect hours ye come fair and sublime bearing the sweet form of the baby peace shine golden star O oh, shine over earth and sea, a herald of the time that is to be. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. End of poems by Marietta Holley.